Good morning. We're ready to call the board meeting to order. Is Miss Taylor available? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning, Miss Taylor. If you'd please call the roll. Certainly. Chairman Vasquez. Present. Vice Chair Schaefer. I unmuted uh, present. Thank you. Member Gaines. Present. Member Cohen. Present. Deputy Controller Stowers. Present. We do have a full quorum uh, present and the board meeting is called to order. Uh, with that, let me just uh, Remind folks once again, <clears throat> uh, this is a continuation meeting. Uh, so it's my understanding as a continuation, I guess we're, we're, we don't have to formally do another Pledge of Allegiance unless members choose to do so. So with that, uh, once again, a, a friendly reminder that we're all Hello? sharing the same line. And today it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge because I know we have several guest speakers that'll be on the line with us. So your patience and for those that are in the on the main line with us, if you would just please uh, work with us uh, specifically when you're speaking, uh, make sure that we're able to recognize you and get your names and titles for the record. So our transcriptionist could be as accurate as possible as she's transcribing these minutes for us. Uh, with that, uh, let me open it up uh, if the members have any uh, yeah. opening remarks before we take on the first order of business here. I read the paper five young men, young men and women are going good to morning. school. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Your mic is on. Member Schaefer, I think. You're, oh, now he's mic. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Um, Vasquez. Yes, I Member Cullen, go ahead. I have a few remarks. May I? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. It's good to see you uh, on Zoom this morning. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, we are reopening um, the hearing to conduct a mid-course review of the guidance that the Board of Equalization has been given regarding remote ac remote uh, assessment appeals board hearings. Beginning in March of 2020, we all shared we all were part of this public health crisis. The pandemic meant that we had to apply new thinking and to respond in a critical way that we really never have done in um, our existence, um, which also included a new way of conducting business. Over the course of 2020, the board has conducted uh, hearings to provide guidance for remote AABs. And we've listened to stakeholders. We have heard from the clerks of the assessment appeals, uh, we've heard from county assessors, we've heard from taxpayers, and we've heard from taxpayer advocates, as well as members of the public. And uh, we want to understand the real world challenges facing the a remote assessment appeals board, particularly paying careful attention and thoughtfulness to technology, to the challenges of having remote AABs. So I also want to ensure that the due process rights of all parties were protected and of course will continue to be protected as we continue to move forward. The board issued guidance through letters to the assessors and today we reopened our hearings um, um, to bring and brought back stakeholders so that we can hear their views. I'd like to know what worked, what didn't work. Um, and based upon their comments and the comments that we've received from the public, I want to acknowledge that we may wish to modify our guidance um, or continue our guidance without any change. Just want to let you know I have no agenda. I'm just here to really receive information and then make the um, appropriate augmentations where and, and when needed. I also want to acknowledge that we're going to be also examining whether additional guidance is necessary through regulation uh, or through statutes. So that is what I'm going to be listening for uh, with a critical ear. Whatever we decide to do, uh, it's important to recognize that the Board of Equalization has an obligation to provide guidance to all 50 counties. You know that, I know that. 
And so that through that obligation, that means that uh, we listen and learn what has worked well and understand what needs to be changed. So with that overview, I'd love for us to go ahead and dive in and, and to begin uh, the reopening of these hearings. Uh, I think first we're going to hear from BOE staff. Um, then we will hear from the representatives of the clerks of the assessment appeals boards. We will then hear uh, the perspective of county representatives, uh, followed, followed by taxpayer representatives. And then, of course, we will take public comment and hear from the public. Um, so with that perspective, I turn the meeting and the hearing back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just go back uh, for a minute here and let uh, Ms. Taylor uh, announce the item and then give her opening remarks and then we'll go through. Uh, it, it's fine, Ms. Cohen. I was going to have and have it come after, but I guess we're, we're OK. Well, let me just officially have her announce the item and then we'll reopen the, the hearing. Ms. Taylor. Thank you. Would you like me to also read the announcement regarding the public teleconference participation? Yes, why don't, why don't we do that? Just because there's a lot of new members that are listening as well. Excellent. I will start with that. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning and thank you for joining today's Board of Equalization meeting via teleconference. Throughout the duration of today's meeting, you will primarily be in a listen only mode. As you may know from our public agenda notice and our website, we have requested that individuals who wish to make a public comment fill out the public comment submission form found on our additional information webpage in advance of today's meeting or participate in today's meeting by providing your public comment live. After the presentation of an item has concluded, we will begin by identifying any public comment requests that have been received by our board proceeding staff with the AT&T operator providing directions for you to identify yourself. After all known public commenters have been called, the operator will also provide public comment instructions to the individuals participating via teleconference. Accordingly, if you intend to make a public comment today, we recommend dialing into the meeting on the teleconference line as the audio broadcast on our website experiences a one to three minute delay. When giving a public comment, please limit your remarks to three minutes. We ask everyone who are not intending to make a public comment, please mute their line or minimize background noise. If there are technical difficulties when we are in the public comment portion of our meeting, we will do our best to read submitted comments into the record at appropriate times. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Uh, with that, do you want to officially announce the first item or should I just jump into the opening? Certainly, I can announce. OK. The first item on today's agenda is M3, public policy hearings, update, impact of public calamities on property tax administration, county boards of equalization, assessment appeals boards, remote hearings, a reopening of discussion and possible action regarding procedural and due process issues in remote hearings to ensure continuity of business in the pandemic and other calamities, protect the rights of all parties, provide guidance, and seek additional authorities or actions if required. Following the testimony of the listed speakers, other individuals and members of the public will be invited to participate. This matter will be presented by Chairman Vasquez and Member Cohen. Thank you. Uh, members, we are very fortunate to reconvene the statewide continuity of AAB operations work group with their collective experience and expertise to update us on current issues and provide input on the type of guidance needed from the board in addressing remote hearing issues. I want to thank each work group member for accommodating our schedule today and for your written materials and submissions in preparation for this meeting, this hearing. Since the extension of the two year deadline under AB 137 will be expiring on December 31st, this hearing is critically important and timely for deciding our next steps. We have 10 work group members, six AAB representatives, one assessor representative, one taxpayer representative, 
and two BOE staff representatives. In addition to a special statewide survey presentation by the CA CEO Assessment Appeals um, Group Chair John McKibben. Member Cohen and I will host and lead the discussion. Ms. Taylor will announce each sub item on the agenda and she will announce each speaker who will address the item in, or <clears throat> in the order of their appearance on the agenda. I will call on the board members for their comments and questions first and then we'll ask for the work group members for their questions and comments. I know we're all looking forward to an in informative and robust discussion with some recommended options for future board action. Following the testimony of the listed speakers, members of the public will be invited to participate. For your convenience of all, <clears throat> We will take a lunch break at 1230 and possibly two five minute breaks as needed. Uh, and I was going to turn it back over to member Cohen for opening remarks, but I believe she may have made them or if not, if she wants to add something to it, let me give her that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and colleagues. You heard me. I'm very excited. I jumped the gun. I uh, have already okay. made my opening remarks. We can just go ahead and get started. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call the sub item A. Our first sub item is A, current status, review of actions taken by the Board of Equalization regarding remote AAB hearings, issues addressed in informational hearings, see letters to assessors number 2020-063 and 2021-002, and letters to assessors issued regarding extensions of the two-year deadline under AB 107 and AB 137. The speakers and the two BOE representatives are Mr. David Young, Deputy Director, Property Tax Department, California State Board of Equalization, Richard Moon, Senior Counsel, State Board of Equalization. Our first speaker yes. will be Mr. Moon, Senior Counsel. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Vasquez and board members. As you know, the Board of Equalization and counties are authorized by the California Constitution and statutes to administer state property taxes, including the appeal of value. In administering these functions, the agencies are guided by statutes that govern various processes and procedures and by constitutional considerations such as due process. Most of the authorities governing assessment appeals are contained in Revenue and Taxation Code 1601 through 1645.5, as well as Property Tax Rules 301 through 326. Additionally, some counties have adopted uh, local rules for their assessment appeals boards or county boards of equalization. Based on these authorities and prior to the passage of AB 107 last year, there might have been some question as to whether counties had authorization to hold remote hearings. However, AB 107 put any such questions that may have existed to rest by adding Section 1616 to the Rev and Tax Code, allowing counties to hold remote hearings if they choose. Of course, many details about the conduct of remote, remote hearings remain open, and the board under your leadership has been instrumental in trying to guide on some of those details. David Young, Deputy Director of, of the Property Taxes Department, uh, will give a brief overview of BOE's actions regarding remote hearings um, that lead to this public hearing. Thank you. Yes, good, good morning, Chair Vasquez and honorable members of the board. This is David Young. I'm the Deputy Director of the Property Tax Department. Let me first apologize for not being on camera right now. I'm experiencing some technical difficulties. Hopefully I will get that solved uh, in the near future. But today I am here to give you a review of the actions taken by the Board of Equalization regarding remote assessment appeals hearings. First, I would like to begin with thanking each and every person that came and provided testimony before the board during the drafting process of our guidance and to thank in advance those here today to provide valuable feedback on how remote hearings are serving 
all stakeholders. To start, following COVID-19 shelter-in-place orders, the State Board of Equalization led the formation of the board's COVID-19 County Board of Equalization slash Assessment Appeals Board's Collaborative Work Group. The work group was comprised of experts representing taxpayers, county assessors, clerk, clerks of the Assessment Appeals Board, and county councils. The purpose of the work group was to examine and report on the most pressing local assessment issues arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. One such issue was the need to, for further guidance pertaining to both the conduct of and the increased use of remote hearings by local assessment appeals board or local boards of equalization. The board held meetings with, work, with the work group on August, 19, on August 18th and August 19th of 2020, September 23rd of 2020, and had discussions at the board meetings on October 21st and November 18th of also 2020. As a product of these meetings, three letters to assessors were developed to provide general principles guiding assessment appeals <coughs> boards when holding remote hearings. The board issued LTA 2020-057 on November 18, 2020, LTA 2020 063 on December 16, 2020, and LTA 2021 002 on January 13, 2021. Each successive LTA superseding the prior, with each successive LTA superseding the prior. The final LTA provided guidance on the authority to conduct remote hearings, the rights of hearing participants, technology and document submission, hearing conferences, scheduling and notices, withdrawals of applications, information requests, among, and amongst other topics. In brief, the letter to assessor provided that the guidance should be read consistently with existing statutes, property tax rules, and the board's assessment appeals manual. It also provided for the protection of the rights of hearing participants and the promotion of efficiencies in the hearing process. In addition, the board issued LTA 2021-039 to provide guidance on the passage of Assembly Bill 137. Effective Jan July 16, 2021, Assembly Bill 137 amended Section 1604F of the Revenue and Taxation Code by extending from March 31, 2021 to December 31, 2021, the two-year deadline by which an Assessment Appeals Board is required to render a final determination. That is a that is my recap of the board's actions so far. I, along with you, look forward to a robust discussion on how this uh, how remote hearings have been serving our stakeholders. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, members. Do we have any? Uh, comments or questions of either Mr. Moon or Mr. Young. Seeing and hearing none. Let me turn to uh, any <coughs> work group member on the line who may have uh, comments or questions. I can't see you all, but I guess if you speak up, if especially anybody else on the line from the work group, by all means. Hearing and seeing none. Uh, Ms. Taylor, if uh, do we have any public comment on this item? We do not have any written public comments, but I can go out to the AT&T moderator 
AT&T moderator, can you let us know if there was anyone who would like to make a public comment on this matter? Certainly, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to make a public comment, please press one then zero at this time. Once again, if you'd like to make a public comment, please press one then zero. And we have no one in queue at this time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call sub item B. Sub item B is report on the surveys of responses received from AABs regarding remote AAB hearings. The speaker is Mr. John McKibben, committee chair, California Association of Clerks and Election Officials. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members. Um, John McKibben on behalf of the CACEO, California Association of Clerks and Election Officials. Our, our members really appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today about their experience during the last fiscal year with remote assessment appeals hearings. This information is based on a survey that was in, actually initially triggered by an inquiry from member Cohen and her staff earlier this summer. Um, and I'm going to just acquaint you with uh, the results of that survey. Um, our survey was intended, first of all, to gauge county experience with remote hearings, asking questions like, did many counties offer remote hearings between July 2020 and July 2021? What challenges did they encounter in conducting remote hearings? Uh, what plans do counties have for using remote hearings in the future? And what the clerk's timetable for transitioning back to in-person hearings during the pandemic or after the pandemic. And then what additional guidance, if any, would clerks want to recommend to your board with regard to remote hearings? As we did in our letter, I want to point out that the survey did not ask counties to provide extensive data about hearings and continuing workload. We tried to keep it as simple, so as, as, simple as possible so as to encourage counties more counties to respond than might otherwise be the case if we had presented with our members with a lengthy data heavy survey form. However, we have representatives of three of our member counties today who can provide you with more detailed information than I possibly can about their varied experience with remote hearings and their plans for the future with regard to assessment appeal uh, hearing formats that they're going to offer. They can also answer questions that you have about details of their experience. We also will have a presentation by Deputy County Counsel Tom Parker in some on some recommendations that we wish to make for additional BOE guidance on remote hearings. Um, most responding counties, uh, over 70%, offered remote hearings during, uh, whether fully remote or hybrid, at some point during the survey period. And as expected, remote hearings were more common among the large counties and medium-sized counties, although a majority of the small responding counties uh, utilized remote hearings to some degree as well. Um, there seems to be a sentiment that remote hearings are generally more useful or at least easier to conduct when used for administrative hearings and stipulations and that sort of uh, appeal matter. In other words, non evidentiary matters. However, most counties that offered remote hearings offered at least some evidentiary hearings. Uh, two thirds of county responding counties did that. Counties mentioned the following problems and challenges encountered with remote hearings. Um, remote hearings sometimes require more staff, which can be very uh, problematic for the clerks who have very small staff in the small counties. Um, remotes require more management planning and preparation than in-person hearings. Uh, there were frequent delays encountered in hearings due to interruptions in service and other tech-related problems, especially taxpayer tech issues. Um, sometimes there's very burdensome copying requirements on the clerk when a party submits uh, paper documents as evidence that ha then has to be converted to an electronic record and then uh, shared the, on the day of the hearing with the participants. Sharing evidence, uh, sharing evidence often goes slowly, uh, especially rebuttal evidence that cannot be provided by parties until after the hearing begins. Uh, remote hearings are often less productive because they are slower. 
Uh, occasional problems were encountered in ensuring that only legally permitted persons are present during the testimony and discussion of trade secrets. Um, and parties often fail to comply with deadlines for submitting evidence prior to the hearing, which makes it very difficult for the clerk to get things to the, all of the participants timely. Nonetheless, several of the counties noted that remote hearings served the very important purpose of allowing counties to continue to hear and dispose of many pending appeals, despite some of the administrative challenges posed by remotes. This has allowed counties, especially some of the very large with very large appeal caseloads to continue to make headway in disposing of appeals. And many of the problems can be overcome, but this is after all has been a learning process that will take a little time. Um, it's interesting to note that at least one county has developed in-house a very effective online system for document submission and distribution of evidence, and that has speeded evidence sharing at the remote hearings. We believe that as people gain more experience in the use of their own technology, many common taxpayer side tech problems can be avoided. Thus, we expect that remote hearings will become even more efficient as time goes on. Now, some positive aspects of remote hearings mentioned by responding counties included the fact that remote hearings allowed counties to comply with health authority orders and to ensure the safety of the participants. Uh, especially in counties that need it the most, assessment appeals boards have continued to remain productive during the pandemic. By eliminating the commute time for the participants, remote hearings can run longer during the day than most in-person hearings, making remotes a little more productive than they might otherwise be on occasion. Uh, remote hearings are useful and convenient for taxpayers who have access to the appropriate technology. And counties can run more than one AAB on any given day easily and allow a clerk to reassign uh, more efficiently any taxpayer appeal that was scheduled can be scheduled to another board that has finished its calendar before the hearing day has ended. So we can move applicants around uh, quite easily. Uh, responses from the counties indicated that slightly more than half of the responding counties will return to offering only in-person hearings, and many have already done so. Uh, nearly 40% of the respondents will offer both remote and in-person hearings, although a slight majority of those will, e will either only provide remote hearings if specifically requested by a party, or will provide remote hearings only under special circumstances. Two responding counties will only continue to offer remote hearings temporarily until such time as local health authorities permit in-person hearings. Only one county indicated that it plans to continue to offer remote hearings as its primary hearing format, even after returning to in-person hearings. As to the timetable for changes in assessment appeals hearing formats, it differs dramatically from county to county. Uh, 10 of the 22 counties that offered some form of remote or hybrid hearing have already returned to either some or all in-person hearings. Six hope to be able to return to in-person or some combination of formats by this fall. Two may return to using an in-person hearing early in 2022, and two county responses specifically stated that they will return to in-person hearings when health authorities say it is safe to do so. As we indicated in our letter, clerks are very grateful for your board's guidance with regard to remote hearings over the last year or so. And we appreciate this new opportunity to make further recommendations for some additional guidance on this subject that will carry us into the future. All 30 of the counties that responded to a question about whether additional guidance is necessary clearly indicated that guidance is indeed necessary. Um, in order to streamline the remote process further and more importantly to preserve the county's authority to control their local process and their calendars. This is crucial. However, we have found that some of the existing language in LTA 2021-002 has led to an increase in unnecessary delays in the appeal process and additional vacated hearing days, both of which are hampering local boards in getting through their caseloads. Further, although the LTA permits counties to require that evidence be submitted to the clerk up to three business days before the hearing, too often parties, whether taxpayers or assessors, submit evidence 
after the deadline or sometimes not until the day of the actually the day of the hearing. That is a problem that, that's going to have to be addressed for the clerks in order to make this this work. We believe that our proposed changes to the LTA will appropriately address those problems in a way that protects what is properly due process and in a way that does not constitute a one size fits all solution for all counties. It will foster better use of the public's money in conducting appeal hearings and will result in prompt board decisions to the benefit of both parties. However, I'll defer to Mr. Tom Parker, who will give a detailed test, give detailed testimony on the proposed changes to the LTA and the underlying underlying reasons for those changes. Um, our letter indicated one more thing I would like to recommend to your board. Um, existing assessment appeal records retention requirements in government code section 25105 and 25105.5 impose burdensome copying requirements when documents and other evidentiary materials are submitted to the clerk electronically, which is often the case, of course, in, relate, in relation to remote hearings. The language of the statute requires the clerk then to create paper doc copy of the documents that are submitted electronically, which is a pointless activity, but one that is mandated under these outdated statutes. CACO members respectfully request that your board review this matter and seek appropriate board sponsored legislation next year to address the problem and clerks are prepared to support such legislation. So in summary, this most recent survey results appear to uh, validate CACEO survey of the pros and cons of remote hearings that was conducted back in March of this year and which was based on much uh, on, on a much smaller sampling. Overall, it appears that remote hearings have served a very useful purpose in the majority of counties where they were utilized and that the remote hearing option should continue to be available at county option in the future. Thank you very much for your time and attention and for giving us this opportunity to appear before you today, even if it's only remotely. <laughs> thank you and thank you for that excellent work, uh, Mr. McKibben. Uh, I just had one quick question before I open it up to the other members and of the eight counties that rated remote hearings as mostly negative. Mm -hmm. or are there any large counties in that group? Um, let me check. Just one. Just one. OK. Thank you. Uh, members, is there any comments or questions? Uh, Mr. McGibbons. Uh, Member Gaines, yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McKibben, for your presentation. I appreciate it. And just in regard to uh, rural county remote hearings, I represent a lot of rural counties, so I'm just curious as to um, was there any information gleaned in terms of quality of technology? I know that uh, I live in a county where um, the internet is sporadic and um, so I'm wondering if if that provided if there's any negative feedback on that and then secondly what is the impact with uh, improved broadband and even satellite uh, internet uh, Elon Musk has his uh, Starlink which is about ready to launch I think in October and so I'm just trying to you know if you had reliable internet would you have gotten better feedback from rural counties I think possibly so, but it's also uh, an issue, as I understand it in any way, um, it's also an issue of, of resources, both staffing and just the, the ability to purchase a, a, an effective platform to use that bandwidth, if you mm -hmm. will. Uh, now I am I am so not a, a techie, so I can't <laughs> I couldn't possibly get into a, a detailed discussion of, of what technology is necessary, but that's the general feedback that we were getting. Um, okay. It wasn't surprising to me that a lot of counties, small of the counties, uh, didn't respond to the survey because a great many of them don't have assessment appeals boards. Uh, the ones who did respond were counties that that do have a, a one assessment appeals board at least. Okay. Do those? So what happens in those counties? It, would it go back to the board of supervisors? Yes. Yeah, the, the, under the Constitution, the County Board of Supervisors is the Board of uh, Equalization for the county, unless it chooses to create one or more assessment appeals boards. 
Okay. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other comments or questions of Mr. McKibben? I think I see uh, Vice Chair Schaefer. Yes, Vice Chair Schaefer, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. McKibben, of the uh, uh, eight counties that you discussed, one of them being large, uh, which one was that? Um, bear with me a moment. Uh, Riverside County. Riverside County. And have, you, uh, you confess that you were not a techie. I just wonder what that means. Uh, you're, you seem to be pretty competent this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have no technology background. I'm fortunate to work for a county that has a very, very robust tech support division. And so I had never in my career had had uh, much occasion to worry about that. I can just turn on the computer and do what I need to do. But yeah, then I'm not I, I to understand too. I'm not an an actual yeah, board if I send you an email, you, you if I send you an email, uh, you can read it, right? Yes, I can. <laughs> oh, thank you. I can even send you an email in return. That's good. That's good. And uh, we all read websites too sometimes. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a rather simple thing. I don't consider myself a big techie, and I'm older than you, and probably not any more technical efficient than you. But I do get a lot of joy out of the uh, computer and. Uh, uh, fortunately, I have people around that I can ask these uh, questions that uh, seniors like you and I always have to ask others, you know, and That's so right. it works out okay. <laughs> I appreciate the good work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, if there's no other comments or questions <clears throat> for Mr. McGibbon, we will have uh, Ms. Taylor, if she would please. Uh, you know what? Did we check already with uh, AT and T on this one, Mrs. Taylor? Uh, not yet. Okay, let's check before we move on. Thank you. Uh, we do not have any written comments. AT and T moderator, can you let us know if there was anyone who would like to make a public comment on this matter? Okay. Once again, if you do want to make a public comment, please press one then zero at this time. One zero. And we have no questions in queue. Thank you. Uh, with that, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call the sub item C. Certainly. Sub item C, evaluation of remote AAB hearings, county perspectives. There will be seven speakers. Uh, and they will be Alina Kasparian, Acting Chief, Assessment Appeals Division, Executive Office of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, Thomas Parker, Deputy County Council, Los Angeles County, Ann Moore, Chief Deputy Clerk, San Diego County Board of Supervisors, Marcy Berkman, Retired Deputy County Council, Santa Clara County, and Kathy McClell. McClellan, Assistant Clerk of the Board of Supervisors, Sacramento County, and the Honorable Ernest Dronenberg, Jr., President, California Assessors Association, and San Diego County Assessor Recorder Clerk. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Will you introduce, <clears throat> you will now in the order of the names will appear on the agenda. As you begin your presentation, please state your name, title, and who you represent for the record. Uh, Ms. Taylor, go ahead. We will begin with Ms. Alina Kasparian, Chief of the AAB Division, Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors Executive Office. Ms. Kasparian, are you available? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members of the board. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, um, John McKibben and Tom Parker, for all the hard work you guys have put in um, to all of this. Um, so my name is Alina Kasparian. I'm the acting assistant chief with LA County Assessment Appeals Board. Um, I would like to share, you know, initially, of course, remote hearings were challenging. And if you asked any one of us, including the AAB board members, we would all say it was not successful um, and that we couldn't wait until we resumed hearings in person. Fast forward, um, it's been almost one year we've been operating our hearings um, 
remotely. And recently a survey um, asking all of our AAB board members, clerks, including taxpayers that we've received feedback from, almost every single one of them um, indicated they preferred remote hearings. Um, you know, I, I, of course, technology wise, there's a huge challenge. Um, and I think for, for LA County, we've been fortunate enough to, you know, have the resources. And as, you know, Mr. McKibben stated, um, the IT infrastructure and, you know, our internal IT team built us this system that's been working very nicely, um, you know, for document submissions and sharing of the documents the day of the hearing, keeping those documents confidential until the clerk makes it um, accessible to all parties and where they're able to view and download even on their own screen and submit rebuttal evidence um, even in the middle of the hearing. So that's been a huge, huge change for us. And I think because of that, um, we have been running quite smoothly. Um, I think some of the you know biggest thing for us, I mean, ultimately as a public servant, you know, our job is to serve the taxpayers and that's our number one priority. And just operating remotely, the amount of efficiencies we've been able to implement and change um, has been enormous. You know, taxpayers no longer need to drive all the way down to the Kenneton Hall of Administration in downtown LA. They don't have to pay for parking. They don't have to sit here all day waiting because if they checked in, you know, they're the fifth member, they have to sit there and wait. And sometimes that means, you know, they're they're heard at three, four o'clock. Um, and oftentimes those cases are continued due to time constraints. Um, so I think ultimately for us, it's been, you know, most efficient and beneficial to taxpayers. Of course, yes, there are some who are, you know, don't have the access and we've made accommodations for them. We've even created a, um, a, a commuter room in our building where we brought them in and we set up our own equipment and, you know, they're, they're able to access and use with the assistance of one of our staff. Um, so I think ultimately it's, it's been great. We've received even positive feedback for some of our large agents, some of our complex cases um, because of the system and how smoothly everything is running. Um, so I think overall for us, we are, you know, the amount of time and resource and, and money we've spent on this, um, we've been very, very um, successful and we hope to continue um, in this platform. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, our next speaker will be Mr. Thomas Parker, Deputy County Council, Los Angeles County. Chair Vasquez and honorable members of the State Board, thank you for the opportunity to testify before your board today on these very important items. I am Thomas Parker, Deputy County Council for Los Angeles County, and I am the LA County AAB Council of Record. The intent of the proposed LTA language from the CACEO uh, is not meant to and does not expand current AAB authority. It only clarifies and seeks state board recognition through LTA language that all can read and rely upon in terms of understanding the local AAB's authority Further, addressing, addressing these issues as proposed in the LTA will help county AABs resolve pending appeal, appeals more quickly for taxpayers and avoid waste of taxpayer dollars, which is very important to the AAB system as well as to taxpayers. AABs constitutionally, as well as practically speaking, have the necessary authority to manage their calendars. The statutory penalty for failing to do that is found at RTC, Revenue and Taxation Code 1604C, the automatic enrollment of the taxpayer's opinion of value. This in turn triggers the automatic refund of property taxes already paid by that taxpayer for that tax year in question because of the automatic refund of taxes paid by the county auditor controller's office when the enrolled property value is changed as a matter of law. AABs 
since 2020, as has been previously testified to, have found three major problem areas of significance. One is the perception that due process mandates the ability of the taxpayer to choose the exact format of the hearing, in other words, remote or in person. Two, the recurring practice of parties requesting postponements less than 21 days before the start of the first hearing, including on the day before the hearing commences. Three, the recurring practice of parties, assessors and taxpayer applicants, failing to timely submit their hearing documents when a remote hearing is being used. Regarding the first, Revenue and Taxation Code 1616, which was referred to by Mr. Moon um, a few minutes ago in this meeting, makes it clear that remote hearings are the same as in-person hearings under the law. There is no due process difference between the two hearing types. Due process considerations are therefore fundamentally the same. Due process requires timely hearings, direct and cross-examination of witnesses, the ability to submit evidence, confront witnesses, and present your case to an impartial hearing body. There is no constitutional due process right on the part of the taxpayer applicant to demand a remote hearing versus an in-person hearing, or vice versa, as the current LTA language 2021-002 suggests. And further, there is no legal authority for that legal conclusion. AABs are experiencing demands from taxpayer applicants for what one type of hearing only, and sometimes not only demanding a particular type of hearing, they are re refusing to execute a time waiver. In Los Angeles County, for instance, in 2020, one taxpayer rejected a remote hearing format, wanted an in-person format. They also refused to appear at the county building in downtown LA at that time because of the COVID situation. And last of all, they would not sign a time waiver. The two-year statutory period was coming to its end, so we had to get a hearing done one way or another. What we did was we scheduled an in-person hearing at the county building, which was normally closed to the public because of COVID. All public health order requirements were met in the room so we could hold the hearing, and we got the hearing done within the two years. But I cite this as an example of how taxpayers can demand a particular kind of hearing and make it very difficult for the AAB to get it done without penalty. County AABs, especially those with a significant appeal workload, must be able to manage their calendars just as superior courts do and, AA, and have always had that authority. AABs and I know the State Board knows this, but I, may, I say this to make a point. AABs are the trial courts of the property tax world. AABs will not and do not take lightly taxpayer participation in a hearing format of their choice. But we have to have the ability in given circumstances to give them a hearing timely in whatever format we can give them. The proposed language clarifies and acknowledges the existing rule seeking a uh, seeking post uh, uh, give that authority. I apologize. The proposed language also clarifies and acknowledges that the existing rule regarding seeking postponements is not changed for remote hearings. Again, this goes back to what Richard Moon said a few minutes ago and uh, Revenue and Taxation Code 1616. This goes, nothing has changed in Rule 323 either because of the remote hearings. 
This goes to the heart as well of the AAB's authority over their calendars and potential resulting taxpayer money waste. The third proposed change regards the submission of documents for remote hearings in a timely fashion. This reflects another issue that AABs are having with parties. Hearings run, quote unquote, on documents in a crucial fashion. Just as superior courts have rules on submission of pleadings, motions, etc., AABs as the trial court of the tax world have document submission rules, which are authorized indeed in the current LTA for good reasons with remote hearings. The LTA unfortunately says nothing about what happens when the documents are not timely submitted. AABs currently have and need from the state board recognition that there can be consequences to a party, whether it's the assessor or the taxpayer, not complying with the remote, remote hearing document submission procedures. Delays can often result, and, and that is a practical effect of losing a full or a half day of valuable AAB hearing time and expense when the AABs have that situation. AABs do not get back that time. This result especially wastes taxpayer money. AABs are created to provide independent and impartial property tax dispute rulings. The sooner an appeal is resolved based on, on hearing evidence and argument, the sooner both parties can get on with their lives and, and personal or business or government duties. Taxpayer money waste and loss should not result because AABs are not allowed to properly manage their appeal calendars and workloads. Appeal workloads will vary between counties. For instance, the size of Alpine County, roughly two to 3,000 population and the however many appeals they get from their population versus a county the size of Los Angeles, or San Diego or Orange County or Marin County or San Francisco County. One size does not fit all. I know your board knows that, but I say that to make this point. Remote hearings are legally the same as in-person hearings as a matter of statute and due process for both hearing types is fundamentally the same. Parties, whether the assessor or the taxpayer, have no due process right to choose the kind of hearing they choose. In a place like Los Angeles, as you heard from Ms. Kasparian, if the taxpayer doesn't have the computer equipment or the expertise to participate in a remote hearing, we give them that opportunity to equalize the playing field. So it can be done. Lastly, AABs do not and will not foist upon parties a hearing format that they don't want as a practical matter unless, and I stress what I'm about to say, there is no other feasible way to get the hearing done in a timely fashion. All due process features will be part of the hearing, whether it's remote, or in person. With that, I thank you for your board's time and consideration. I'll answer any questions you have, and I appreciate your giving me the time to speak. I see a hand from Vice Chair Schaefer. Uh, do we want to wait until we hear all the speakers, or is it something you want to ask specifically to Mr. Parker, uh, Vice uh, Chair? To Mr. Parker. Go ahead. Yeah, Vice Chair Schaefer here. Uh, Mr. Parker, did that gentleman that would not come down to the county building, did he eventually come down when you set him a hearing? Yes, he did, sir. Do you help any of the people with parking or they sort of figure that out for themselves? Um, no, sir. The county does not reimburse folks for things like parking. I do appreciate very much you're making computer facilities and assistance available to people. and. I would hope that all of our counties would do that if it's necessary. Do you know if there's any uh, 
movement in that direction in other counties? No, sir, I don't have information. So uh, I really, I wish I could answer your question even in a general way, but I'm not in a position to, sir. And are you uh, working today out of home or out of your office? Uh, my home office, sir. Here in LA, we, uh, we mostly work from home nowadays thanks to COVID. Uh, a couple of day, a couple of days a month, I do go into the downtown office. But uh, as you can see, this is my personal home office in Southern California. Well, I'm fascinated by the background that you have behind you there, and I'm having trouble reading it. And I was going to pay you a visit to your office downtown to check it out, but I see that I'm not going to be able to do that. Well, I can tell you quickly, sir. I have a picture of Willie Mays in the 1954 World Series with the catch, catching it over his shoulder before he threw it all the way back to home plate to nail the Cleveland Indian baseball player hoping to score on the Giants. That's one. Um, three of them are movie posters. Here I am, LA, should not be surprising. And the fourth item, sir, is an actual um, first page of a music sheet from that Frank Sinatra used at whatever point in his live concert career. Oh, it's, well, I, I went there. I went to his 100th birthday party in Las Vegas. It was put on by the Grammys. I've been a big fan. And uh, uh, I want you to know that today, uh, you being a big baseball fan, today is Tommy Lasorda's 94th birthday. Yes, sir. Uh, he was an outstanding manager. And I say that despite, and I hope I'm not biasing anyone, I am a Giants fan, but I give full due credit to Mr. Lasorda. And you know, your name is big down here in San Diego. Uh, it's actually Francis Parker. Oh, uh, <laughs> honored to hear that, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Vasquez, this is yes. Ms. Taylor. Uh, we're Ms. having difficulty with our captioner. So if you don't mind holding a moment, we're trying to resolve that technical issue. Sure, we'll wait. While we're buying some time, uh, I didn't realize we had a giant fan on the line here. <laughs> you got another one. Uh, that, well, I know you're, you're, but you're, no, you're I, I mean, this fellow's in the LA area. No, I, I started off, but he sir, must have grew up I, in the Bay Area. I started off in Northern California, sir. I kind of figured that. El Dorado County. That was my first county job in California. So, Although uh, my, Younger brother was a big fan of Willie Mays. Um, I, I will tell you too, I came to California in 86 and I had to choose between Stanford and Cal Berkeley. And I chose Cal Berkeley to my eternal sports regret, but I'm holding true to the Golden Bears. <laughs> Go Bears. Uh, Vice Chair Shaper, uh, I'm, I'm Cal Berkeley and glad to see that, Tom. Thank you, sir. My son's a Berkeley grad. And I'm a Trojan, so I guess we're on opposite ends here. Yes, sir. But respectfully, I hope. We know, definitely. Nothing like a good challenge. Ms. Taylor, are we still in pause mode? Uh, yes, thank you for your patience. The captioner is working with her technical support. Not a I'll problem. I'll keep you posted. spent 14 years in El Dorado as their uh, tax lawyer. So uh, I am, I was also in Calusa County as county council. So I, I am familiar and I can tell friends, I can just tell, and I'm glad to say it on the record, Mr. Gaines, in Calusa, the, their board of supervisors is the local board of equalization. Yes, all right. They, they hold their equalization hearings, the few that they have on the same Tuesday of their scheduled Board of Supervisors duties. Just to let you know, sir. Okay, great, thank you. How, how Calusa will do it. Yeah, thanks for your service in Colorado County. Uh, Chairman Vasquez, um, yes. may, we take, may we take a five minute break to resolve this technical issue? Sure.
So we'll try uh, to reconvene Vasquez, at 11 10, uh, I guess. Member Vasquez and members, honorable members, this is Brenda Fleming, Executive Director. Uh, may I uh, support uh, Ms. Taylor's request, but may I ask that you extend it to 10 minutes? I'm just concerned that five minutes, we just, it was time for them to resolve it and for us to do a quick check uh, so that you don't return, because even during this chatter, we would need to be recording the, the information. So 10 minute break, sir, if you would, uh, if you would allow. Sure, so we'll reconvene at 11.15. That's perfect, thank you, sir. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and get, Started, Ms. Taylor. I, I see uh, Ms. Moore on the line. Thank you. I'll introduce her as our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Ms. Ann Moore, Chief Deputy, Chief Deputy Clerk, San Diego County Board of Supervisors. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for allowing me the time to speak with you this morning about San Diego County's experience with virtual assessment appeal hearings. My name is Ann Moore, and like she said, I'm the Chief Deputy Clerk of the Board of Supervisors here in San Diego County. We are proud of the virtual experience that we've been able to offer over the past year. Um, as I was assume is the experience of most agencies, there were some bumps along the road, but our office has maintained a focus on ensuring that we minimized hearing delay and that taxpayers are afforded the due process even in times when in-person hearings are prohibited by local health code. Because of that, very few hearings had to be completely postponed due to shelter in place orders. With virtual hearings, there were some pervasive issues beyond our control that I did want to share with you today. Within the hearings themselves, the primary issue was the handling and distribution of hearings exhibits. For some context, for our in-person hearings, the parties bring physical copies of their exhibits and distribute them at the time their case is called. Should there be any issues or discussion between the parties, they can step aside to discuss while the board proceeds to handle other matters. This keeps the calendar moving forward and allows us to support a larger number of cases each hearing date. Obviously, we've been unable to operate in the same way for virtual hearings. In an attempt at efficiency and using the authority granted in LTA 2021-002, San Diego requires parties on virtual hearings to electronically submit exhibits 72 hours in advance. This allows our office time to compile all the exhibits and be ready to distribute them to the board members and the parties once an item is called the challenge is that the LTA does not grant us any means to enforce the required time frame. Routinely, our staff is faced with exhibits submitted in the hearing or supplementals submitted just before the item is called. The parties, understandably, because of their desire to not continue the hearing, agree that late submission is fine amongst them. So without any recourse on our part, the hearing proceeds, but not before an extensive delay as our staff deals with the late submissions. We have to confirm that we received them via email or let them know that we did not and wait for them to resubmit. Then we have to compile what we've received, make sure that they're complete, and then distribute to everyone and confirm that everyone has received them, sometimes resending to alternate email address. The process often results in everyone sitting on Zoom for sometimes 30 minutes or more waiting for exhibits to get where they need to go. Sometimes we have issues where some files are too large or in some formats that can't be opened. And while all this is figured out via the Zoom hearing, there isn't a way to pass the case and have the parties sort through the files. The need for our clerk to manage the electronic exhibits requires the focus to stay on this particular case. We don't want to be the cause of setting over any appeals hearings, but recognize that the frequent delays caused by a handful of hearings with exhibit issues has ripple effects on the due process of other taxpayers. We were already setting our calendars with less hearings to accommodate the increased length of hearings due to the format and delays due to late evidence submission forced us to further reduce the number of hearings we could confidently set on a calendar, pushing out available hearing dates further into the future and in turn affecting the due process for countless other taxpayers. The more hearings we can process through, the better it is for our taxpayer applicants and the better we are able to use the taxpayer funds that are allocated to AAB hearings. And we recognize that other counties have handled virtual ex hearings and exhibit submissions in different ways, depending on local circumstances, and know that some have had resources to resolve this issue with significant technology upgrades. But for the vast majority, including San Diego, we just didn't have the resources. And so we had to um, use email 
and Dropbox to, to facilitate this process. As such, we would like a way to set our own local rules to ensure that we can control our calendars in a way that ensures that we are not pushing out the due process um, of the many to help the few that can't get their exhibits submitted in time. The other major issue that we've run into repeatedly and that we are hoping for additional guidance on is the situation that Tom Parker described where applicants during during the time that we were unable by public health order to have in person hearings requested to continue an in person hearing, but also refused to sign a waiver citing LTA 2021-002 and the rights of hearing participants to mean that due process requires us to provide whichever format that they request, regardless of our ability under public health order or under technological infrastructure or otherwise. We very quickly amassed a large backload of these cases on our clerk's convenience calendar. I will note that, that we were fortunate enough that we did not have any cases that reached their expiration dates prior to resuming in-person hearings, but there were some very close calls and we were at the time trying to determine with the help of our council how to proceed. Should we have to shut down down again in the future, I would hope that we have some guidance on how to handle those cases so we don't have to take that risk again. Saying that in August 2021, in conjunction with our Board of Supervisors, we did transition back to in-person hearings and we're working hard to set the extensive backlog of applicants who requested an in-person only hearing. We are also tracking a number of cases that, since we've returned to in-person, are requesting virtual hearings. We've explored the option of doing certain types of appeals or calendars primarily as virtual, but struggled with how to plan for all the different variations. So instead, we are offering virtual hearings upon request for those who need them, notifying those parties that it may be further out because they, we, they have to be special set in order to accommodate our regularly scheduled hearings and find a board able to take on those additional calendars. I want to stress that while to the board that while virtual hearings have presented new challenges, they've been overall a very positive experience and we consistently have been striving to provide the same level of service and support virtually that we are known for in person. My staff has consistently gone above and beyond to assist parties both inside and outside of hearings, hearings once even running down to the courtyard in front of our building where an applicant was using the county Wi-Fi to participate to help them sign into the meeting and show them how to share their documents. I also want to note that we not only see the value in virtual hearings as a mean to continue operations when our government is restricted to in-person hearings, but we also see the equity and accessibility value in continuing to offer some of these hearings even now. We don't ever want an applicant feeling that they are in a position where, because of their own health conditions, they have to risk exposure coming into an in-person hearing or in the alternative delay or withdraw their application with that resolution. So we plan to continue to offer virtual hearings for those cases as long as we're able to in order to ensure that our office provides equal access to their due process. We do hope though that any new guidance on the matters that discussed in today's meeting does allow for some for counties to retain some discretion. If nothing else, the pandemic has shown us that the experience in one jurisdiction can be vastly different than the experience in others. Local government shutdowns did not happen all at once, and I know that while we reopened in August, other counties such as Los Angeles are continuing virtual hearings until their health officials feel their COVID numbers support reopening. Some others, typically smaller counties, never did go virtual. Instead, they either delayed in person or they proceeded with them perhaps supported by facilities large enough that they were allowed for social distancing within the hearing rooms. On so many levels, our counties are unique, different sizes, different budgets, different technology. Add on to that the vastly different COVID experiences across the localities, and it's clear that at any given time, the needs of San Diego County may not match the needs of Los Angeles, which may not match the needs of Tulare County, and so on. And we hope that we can be empowered with some discretion to ensure equity and efficiency for all parties amidst our own locale's unique circumstances. And I want to thank you again for so much for your time today and for the opportunity to represent San Diego County's virtual experience. Thank you. Thank you. Our next. Oh, I, I see Vice Chair Schaefer. I think you had a specific question to Ms. Moore, but you're muted. I think, believe you're muted though. Yes, I, I'm unmuted now. Vice Chair Schaefer, Ms. Moore, uh, uh, we heard Mr. Parker tell us that they have a room with some computer capacity for those that 
don't have it, uh, do we do that in San Diego or does somebody with a co computer need have to go out and find family or friends? We actually didn't have that same, I don't, we didn't have people approach us in that. The majority of the people who did not want virtual hearings were uncomfortable with the technology all around. So it wasn't that they didn't have access to it, it's that they did not feel comfortable using the virtual hearings and they didn't feel that they would have the same experience online as they would um, in person. So I imagine that we would find ways for them, but we didn't have constituents asking about that. Thank you. You're welcome. I see a hand from member Gaines. Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the presentation by by Ann and uh, was just curious uh, in terms of the remote hearings you had mentioned that uh, in some cases you're waiting up to a half an hour during a zoom meeting to get exhibits yes. and is there is there any required requirement to have the exhibits in place before a meeting is scheduled or is there any other way to to work through that so you're not wasting people's time so we, we do the LTA does support us putting that requirement in, but after evaluation of it by our council and I, I have heard other councils across the state, there is no teeth to it. We, we don't have the power to say, OK, fine, you don't have it. We're going to continue you. It has to be an agreement by or a motion by one of the parties. And so we're in a situation where we ha we are empowered to set the time, the deadline, but we aren't empowered to do anything about it. I see. OK, and so that's what we're looking to to that's the group to. Yes, yeah. yes. OK, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other hands or comments. Uh, Ms. Taylor, if you can continue. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Marcy Berkman, retired deputy county counsel, Santa Clara County. Thank you very much. This is Marcy Berkman, retired deputy county counsel from Santa Clara County. I was counsel for the Santa Clara County Assessment Appeals Board for many years, um, and I appreciate the uh, ability to participate today and having been able to participate in the task force earlier in the pandemic. Um, in Santa Clara County, uh, we had initially uh, closed down before remote hearings uh, due to the pandemic and then reopened uh, we closed down hearings again from December to March, and when we came back, uh, commenced remote hearings. Uh, the experience we had was many of our assessment appeals board members felt more comfortable being in the room together with printed exhibits. Uh, and so for many of them, we went to a hybrid model where our appeals board members were together in their normal, uh, in a large hearing room. Um, together with the clerks who would hand them printed exhibits and the assessors and the applicants would appear remotely. Um, and then as the pandemic opened up and the health situation became better in the county, uh, we went back to live hearings. Um, and I believe just around the time I retire, they were gonna go to having some of the administrative hearings uh, performed remotely um, so that we would have live evidentiary hearings and then some days that would be remote administrative hearings. Um, my experience during the couple months I was there when we were running the hearings is that the administrative hearings seem to be a very good use for the remote hearings in our county um, and the evidentiary hearings less so. Um, and we were blessed that given our health circumstances, we were able to conduct mask socially distanced hearings in a very large hearing room and keep everyone safe with protocols. Um, what our clerks did was in addition to our normal hearing response procedure, which is that after the first hearing notice, you're required to send in a response form indicating whether or not you'll attend. Um, when we were conducting hearings live during the pandemic, we had people check into the room outside of the room rather than just the normal roll call in the room uh, so that we could limit the number of people in the room to the number that the public health officer determined was safe. Um, and the clerks would take the phone numbers for people and call them from wherever they chose to wait to let them know their case was coming up and it was time for them to progress towards the room and enter the room. And in that way, we were able to ensure that even when we were conducting live socially distanced hearings, we were able to do so in a completely safe way uh, so that we wouldn't have anyone fall ill as a result. Um, I'm not sure what the current system is, but what it was at the time I left 
was live evidentiary hearings and an occasional hearing day each month for administrative matters conducted remotely. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions for any of the members? Hearing and seeing none. Ms. Taylor, I think we can continue. Thank you. Our next presenter is Kathy McClellan, Assistant Clerk of the Board of Supervisors, Sacramento County. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share information regarding remote hearings and our experience for Sacramento County. Um, as uh, as Alina alluded to earlier, um, the transition to remote was um, was tough at first and a bit intimidating as we learned the process and and um, plan to do everything differently in order to um, have a successful remote platform and um, format of hearing. Um, in March 2020, we canceled all of our scheduled hearings and uh, by May of 2020, we resumed with only administrative hearings. And this was um, this was a good practice session for us, <laughs> and um, and it was it was actually quite successful, and um, we became comfortable with this, and and we worked the following months in preparing everything for live or for remote evidentiary hearings, and by October 2020, we held our first evidentiary hearings. Um, Communi uh, communication was important. We uh, some of the changes were uh, we started sending emails to the different groups, the different parties involved, and um, wanted to have all the clear information to them so they knew exactly what they needed to do during these meetings and how to log on, all the login information, um, and um, and we also provided all of the the clerk's contact information so all parties were um, we let all parties know that we were readily available to help out in any way they needed whether tech with technology uh, or uploading documentation and so forth and um, concerning the technology sacramento county uses the blue jeans platform for its remote hearings and overall we've had a a lot of success with it and uh but we've had the typical issues that everybody faces with these remote hearings um one being um trouble logging in or connection issues and uh but these have all been able to they've all been resolved without having to having to um reschedule any meetings so that's been a good thing we've had brief pauses while we worked out the the kinks and these things and then we also had the um the difficult the this we also had the um problem of having a bad connection and uh, in this case typically it's the the chair of the board that has a weak um, wi-fi connection i think it is and um fortunately there's a, been a workaround for that too because when that happens you can still use your laptop or your desktop computer but you can call in and have a clear clear communication and so uh, that was resolved and um, just with a short delay as far as document submission um, I agree with all that we do need to have some um, some way of letting the local AABs determine their timeline as it fits their county for submission of documentation. Uh, although that, although we are considered a large county, we have a much smaller caseload than, uh, say, San Diego or Los Angeles. Our uh, appeal caseload last year was uh, we received 1,300 applications. So um, quite a bit, <laughs> quite a contrast from Los Angeles County. So I mean, and due to that, I think we don't experience some of the challenges that the larger large counties uh, experience and go through um, but for documentation submission yes that that does 
it, it, it causes the same delay to us as everybody else who has to deal with that with some time. We request 48 hours in advance because our um, our agenda is not as large as maybe some of the others. And uh, we do request 48 hours in advance. And um, the majority of the time, the assessor staff and the and the applicants are, are in compliance with that. Um, but there are times, yes, that we get material sometimes same day in the morning, last minute. And and we do accommodate and we do um, upload this material and it and it does cause delays sometimes to get organized right before a meeting starts at nine o'clock. It's very difficult to do that. So um, we uh, would like the ability to enforce a deadline for that just so we are able to move forward and not waste anybody's time and um, also um, as far as uh, presentation during the meetings um, we I think we do this about the same as, as San Diego County where we we uh, keep the, the information confidential until such time as the item is called into record and then we disseminate this to the parties by email and um, we haven't we've had a pretty successful um, as far as uploading documentation and that end of things we've that's been uh, very successful because we have the smaller document we have a, a email that we request them to send these to and for larger documents anything over 50 megabytes um, we do have a dropbox that's an alternative way to submit documentation and we've had no issues with that so that's uh, that's been a positive for us as well um, overall um, we haven't had um, too many people asking to res to postpone due to waiting for in-person meetings to um, resume um, I believe we've only had um, two instances and uh, and then we didn't have any issues with them providing a waiver. So um, that that was really not an issue. Um, at this time, Sacramento County is continuing with uh, fully remote hearings. Um, I know that there is talk of opening up soon. Um, I, I don't know if we will be doing any hybrid meetings. We may uh, we may uh, look into um, I, I hear that there. I hear that there's something in the works now, um, with some of our other meetings that uh, they're going to have uh, options of uh, hybrid. But I don't know if that will be the case with AAB yet. Um, but we um, we will eventually have some in-person hearings. And if there is an accommodation, if we need to accommodate, we will. We have the option of doing an in-person. And, and some of the issues that go along with deciding whether remote or in person, I, I uh, am in agreement that I, uh, I do believe that this should be left at the, at the uh, county's discretion to decide which format to use because there's so many things in, in play, uh, including the, the local health orders, um, the, uh, the level of comfort a, an AAB member um, has in attending a an in-person hearing. We have two that prefer remote only at this time. So we have these things to take into consideration as well. And, and it isn't one size fits all. And it should be, um, I do believe this should be left up to the local AAB to um, decide what type of meeting they hold based on their circumstances. And, and um, in all of this, uh, we, I do want to say that Sacramento County has um, continued to hear these appeals in a timely manner, working with the assessor's office to get these scheduled and on the agenda um, as expeditiously as possible and, um, and uh, make sure that we're within our two year timeline. And so um, we have been able to do that and thanks to uh, some of these LTAs and um, assembly bills that have allowed for an extension. And um, but overall, the and then um, due process, too, we are always uh, we want to make sure that we stay within due process and, and uh, to expedite 
these appeals as quickly as possible. That that never changed from going from in person to remote, and and we plan to, to do the same going forward. Um, and um, I think that's that's about all I have for that. So. Thank you. Members, do we have any comments or questions of Ms. McKellar? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, Ms. Taylor, we can proceed. Yes, our final speaker today is the Honorable Ernest Dronenberg, Jr., President, California Assessors Association and San Diego County Assessor Recorder Clerk. Mr. Dronenberg, are you available? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't, I failed to unmute. Um, no problem. I brought this, as I alluded to uh, my testimony yesterday, I brought this as well as the other issue up at the uh, Central Southern Conference in San Luis Obispo two weeks ago. And the consensus was that this is, this is a, uh, a, an issue that we both, we all believe that the, the clerks of the board um, have the, the best insight on, but that we are supportive of uh, remote hearings um, and this was a gathering of small as well as large counties and there was no um, dissent that was just um, a group saying we're not the best experts on this. Uh, some of the comments though that relate to this is that um, I think there was a, a feeling that uh, this is a decision that should be made by the uh, clerk as well uh, if the taxpayer representative doesn't want a remote hearing and can be provided a physical uh, hearing and in, in, uh, at a normal location and they turn that down, then there should be some kind of consideration that they waive the two year um, rule on, on acceptance of value as, as submitted. Um, this uh, this would uh, th I think uh, really bring out the truth of um, what the intention of the uh, the uh, idea that they can't meet uh, physically in a location convenient or can't do it remote. Then they um, this would I think separate the the uh, the people that are just doing that to stall and uh, versus those that really have important constraints on their participation. Um, other than that, uh, the general, uh, there was, everybody seemed to, except for some of the small counties, seemed to think that this was a valuable tool to get taxpayers a good hearing in a reasonable amount of time. So um, I'm not going to go into any more detail than that. I think the clerks have done a good job. I've been listening to their comments and support what you would do in this position. Thank you. Uh, members that, oh, I, I see uh, Vice Chair Schaefer, go ahead. Uh, Vice Chair Schaefer here. Uh, uh, President Dronenberg, uh, We've heard from Mr. Parker that they have a room with a computer and some staff help for people that don't have the computer proficiency that you and I do. Uh, uh, is that generally available within the assessors? Do you know? Uh, or do some assessors just never have a request for that? I'd like to think that there are uh, non-proficient people everywhere. Um, Board Member Schaefer, I, we didn't discuss that. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that that you could find that kind of participation limit uh, because they don't have a computer nowadays. But what could be a limit is, as uh, uh, Board 
Member Gaines talked about the lack of good service uh, in some of the rural counties. Um, that could constrain people um, from using their computers. They just can't get a good signal. Um, but uh, nobody that was in attendance in ours was Central and Southern, and generally it's it's uh, a lot better coverage in the South as, as opposed to the small counties. But uh, nobody commented on that. Sure. Uh, Mr. Dronenberg, uh, I'm wondering if in the long range we might end up with fewer than 58 counties, perhaps a consolidation of some of our smaller counties, but you know that's not on our plate now and we're not looking for trouble, but uh, I just think that uh, sometimes in the uh, uh, scheme of things, uh, uh, there comes a time when we stop getting more and more uh, counties and um, sometimes strive for more and more efficiency. Uh, does that ever get thought about at your level? Um, the only consideration of eliminating counties is if we lose some of our northern counties to Idaho um, because of the the uh, persuasion of some of our voters. That's the only discussion I've heard that related to losing the counties is uh, uh, some of those on the border with Oregon and Idaho are thinking that they feel more comfortable in those other states. But other than that, I, nobody talked about it. Sure, thank you. I see a hand from uh, Member Gaines. I am. Yeah, thank you. Uh, appreciate it, uh, President Dronenberg. And I'm just curious because I've heard uh, comments from several of our speakers from uh, Mr. Parker and uh, Ms. McClellan, and I'm just curious about this remote uh, versus in-person, and and maybe this is a broader question, but the, the legality of these hearings and who is making the decision on the hearing. So, and is it is it clear uh, that the county has the authority to make that decision for an appellant uh, as to whether their hearing is in person or done remotely. And have there been any challenges, any any court opinions or challenges to that? Because just speaking to, I've got a friend who's an attorney and he's in court all the time. And he says it's just not the same uh, presenting a case before a judge remotely versus doing it in person. And uh, these are, I think quasi judicial decisions being made and I'm just looking for a little bit more information, a little more clarity in terms of the authority. Well, uh, this, this, this is Marcy Berkman. Um, early on in the pandemic, the State Board of Equalization Council issued an opinion that remote hearings satisfied due process and were hearings. And subsequently, the State Board of Equalization assisted us in obtaining legislation from the state legislature uh, that's now in effect, which added, I believe it was RTC 1616, clarifying that a hearing, is, that a remote hearing is a hearing. Um, and that is what enabled the counties to go forward, uh, continuing to offer remote hearings and began the task force for the rules, the uh, guidelines that SBE promulgated implementing remote hearings. Okay, very well, thank you. I appreciate that call. Uh, Member Gaines, I think you you had an almost two part question. The the other part of the question was choice. Who had the choice? The LTA says that um, that the there the, the taxpayer has the choice. I think um, Mr. Moon would be the expert on this one, uh, but I I think. Um, um, I, I disagree with, respectfully disagree with Mr. Moon on it, and that I think uh, the choice is being used as a lever uh, by uh, less than respectful attorneys um, that are trying to just stall the process instead of uh, have a legitimate request. That's why I, my suggestion that they they automatically would lose the two-year waiver if uh, if they re refuse to take either of the forums. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to just trying to think it through it. 
obviously we want these things to move through efficiently. Don't want them delay after delay after delay unless it's can be justified. Uh, but at the same time, just trying to get the clarity on on that authority. Um, is I'm wondering if we get Mr. Moon to comment um, on the comments that were made by uh, Marcy Berkman, and then also on on your uh, perspective uh, from President Dronenberg on the LTA. Uh, Mr. Gaines, this is uh, Richard Moon from the Legal Department. Um, <clears throat> I, w I agree uh, totally with with what uh, Ms. Uh, Berkman had had, uh, had stated 1616 allows uh, counties to have remote AAB uh, hearings. Um, the LTA that, that was drafted um, at the beginning of this year does state um, that taxpayers um, can uh, receive a, uh, an in-person or a remote hearing. Um, so it, it would uh, leave it to their choice. Um, however, uh, that is subject to the postponement rules of re th Rule 323. So if they're asking for a postponement because they don't want a remote hearing or they don't want an in-person hearing, that would be subject to the postponement rules. And, and in the vast majority of cases, I would imagine that that would require the signing of a waiver of the 1604C uh, deadline. Now, whether that happens or not um, on a practical level or what uh, arguments taxpayers um, are making, it seems to be um, that there are some taxpayers who feel that they do not need to sign a waiver from what we've heard, the testimony we've heard, uh, particularly from uh, Mr. Parker. Um, however, uh, I would say that the, the LTA does not contemplate that. Okay. All right, very well. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, members, are there any other questions or comments uh, for any of the speakers we just heard from before we move on? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, let me just check. Uh, Ms. Taylor, are we able to check with the work group members if they have possibly any questions or comments before we move on? Uh, they are live, so if you would like to have them. Uh, let's see if we hear from it. And if not, I guess we could. We don't have any written comment on this, do we? Correct. We do not have any written comments. And maybe while, we, while we're waiting, why don't we check with uh, AT&T and see if there's anybody on the line? Certainly. It looks like we have Ms. Rabowski. But I think she she might be queuing up for the next section, right? <laughs> I am. And Mr. Chairman, I do have comments in response oh, sure. to some of the things we've heard. However, I'm happy to incorporate that into my broader comments that are coming up next. That might be easiest for everybody. That's your choice. That works. All Let right. me just double check with AT&T real quick. And if there's nobody on the line, we'll move on. Thank you. AT&T moderator, can you let us know if there is anyone who would like to make a public comment on this matter? OK, once again, if you'd like to make a public comment, please press one, then zero. One, zero. And we do not have anyone queuing up for public comment. Ms. Taylor, did I hear nobody was on the line? Correct. OK, with, with that, then uh, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call our sub item D. Sub item D, evaluation of remote AAB hearings, taxpayer representative perspectives. Our speaker is Brianne Rabowski, chair, ad hoc committee on remote hearings, California Alliance of the Taxpayer Advocates and partner Pillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw, Pittman. Good morning, board members. And as everybody has stated so far, I really want to start with my thanks for having you guys reopen the hearings to look at how remote hearings are going and for inviting me on behalf of CADA to speak on this topic. I think it's an incredibly important topic and I commend the board for its continued engagement on this issue. Um, as a single taxpayer speaker today, I do have quite a bit of ground to cover. 
Um, so I will do my best to keep my comments brief, but I do encourage if you have questions or would like me to expound upon something, please certainly ask me to do so. So to begin with, much like CACEO did, we did survey our membership to try and get a broad understanding of the experiences that folks were having in the various counties that were conducting remote hearings. We had a nice response to that survey, and I'm happy to report that by and large, our membership feels that remote hearings are going pretty well. People are having good experiences um, and the vast majority of those with remote hearing experiences, especially those with positive experiences to share, are those who are really working on administrative issues or cases that we would call uh, less complex cases with less number of issues and less exhibits involved. So we have found that for those cases, remote hearings indeed are working quite well. For complex cases, uh, our membership still mostly is not comfortable doing complex hearings through uh, a remote process. So the hope is, as we sort of continue and, and God willing, COVID will get better under control, we would like to see continued use of remote hearings for these administrative processes. And we think it's really beneficial to have it become a permanent feature of assessment appeals board hearings. And further to that, we encourage that more counties adopt the use of remote hearings for things like administrative issues. So sort of with that background, what I'd like to do is I'd like to move on to discuss some of the specific pros that we've heard, as well as cons that we've heard in our survey and in my discussions with our membership. And then at the end, I'll move on to responding specifically to some of the concerns we've heard from various counties, in particular LA County's three points of things that they would like to see changed. So beginning with the pros, the things that are working very well for remote hearings, we found that for the most part, they tend to be more efficient. Um, many, many of our members uh, were very complimentary of LA in particular, who found that the clerks were particularly adept at shifting around the agenda and shifting to matters to ensure that the flow of remote hearings was going quite efficiently and was streamlined. So um, other counties, uh, I think, you know, have a lot to be modeled after LA in terms of ensuring efficiency and streamlining. Some of the things that people really enjoyed uh, and thought improved the process was the cutting out of travel. So the lack of uh, having to travel to present something like a st stipulation or recommendation to the board is a huge benefit to all parties, not only taxpayers that largely bear the expense of travel, but also for assessors for big counties like LA that have satellite offices and require their folks to travel to do these hearings. Um, it also seems to encourage early resolution of issues that can be resolved. So to the extent that there's a procedural issue or something that can be resolved by something closer to a pre-hearing, uh, our membership has experienced that remote hearings allows and better enables and encourages early resolution of those types of issues. The big second category that we hear is ease of use. And there's a couple things here that really complemented ease of use. Um, and those are counties that look to mirror in-person experiences in their remote hearings. So again, to look to LA as a best practices model, LA County will provide breakout rooms. So if you've ever been to an in-hearing person in LA County, you know that the standard cadence of events is you show up at the time that your hearing is scheduled. The assessor shows up at the same time too, but inevitably the board is delayed by a few minutes. And that may in fact be by design because it allows for the parties to interact with one another, to talk about the procedural issues and how they're gonna present 
um, certain things to the board. It allows time for the parties to speak with the clerk about similar issues, procedural issues, and things of that nature. And so by the time the board comes on, you have many of these things sort of sorted out so that you have a very efficient process in front of the board on the front end. And so LA County has taken that in-person experience and looked to mirror it by using breakout rooms, where first you're broken out with your individual parties, then they'll merge the parties together so that you have time to speak with the assessor and the clerk, and then finally you're bringing in the board. And so practices like that, where we're really taking the best of in-person hearings and incorporating them into remote hearings, seem to have worked incredibly well. Um, San Mateo also was highly regarded for their use, at least of pre-hearings, to do remote hearings or remote hearings to do pre-hearings, rather. Um, and those seem to largely mirror in person and, and go quite well as well. Another best practices uh, that seem to make remote hearings easier to use were the use of written protocols. So as with anything, when people know the rules and there's a written understanding of what's expected, what is the procedure going to look like? How is this going to proceed? It seemed as though those hearings had much better responses. Um, it's also highly encouraged that counties post their protocols on the website so that you aren't waiting to get an email from the clerk with a notice or otherwise that would detail the manner in which a remote hearing would be performed. So by posting the protocols online, and I believe this is something San Mateo does and likely LA as well and perhaps others, it gives taxpayers and taxpayer agents the opportunity to internalize what signing up for a remote hearing may look like. So that seems to be something that's worked well. Um, and then finally, in terms of ease of use, it seems like counties are having difficulties with the document submission process, with the upload and the download process that is critical to a remote hearing. LA County has a very sophisticated platform or portal, if you will, that really seamlessly allows for upload and is pretty quick and efficient from what I understand, and also allows for download. So once the exhibit is introduced as part of the hearing, parties can easily download it through the portal and then have access to that document in real time. That particular model seems to really ease some of the document submission and download issues that I'm hearing from other counties. So that's sort of a, a, another pro or best practice, if you will. So those were, you know, in a nutshell, I'm trying to keep it succinct, some of the best things about remote hearings. You know, as with all things, there is a flip side to the coin and there were some cons, most of which align with what the counties were experiencing. So to begin with, the first category is technical issues. So technical issues, everybody agrees, tend to slow things down. A lot of times these are created by the need for large uploads at the last minute. So, you know, having a, a understood process and a protocol for how exhibits should be uploaded and when, um, and having a system like LA's portal that really facilitates the use of or uh, document submission, I think would really ease some of that. There also was a uh, commentary from a number of members that were concerned about some of the language um, or messaging that they were receiving from the counties, where if you don't appear, and perhaps it's due to a tech issue, that that would cause denial of your appeal. Now, I know that's something that we tackled in the LTA, and the LTA specifically states that appeals should not be denied due to technical issues, or at least we discussed should be reinstated to the extent that there was a technical issue. But there was a fear among taxpayers and tax agents that if they proceeded with a remote hearing and had a technical issue, there's not only loss of control, but the burden of having your appeal denied and then having to seek reinstatement of that appeal. So I would imagine if I'm hearing that among my sophisticated members, that that experience or sentiment is shared widely with smaller taxpayers. 
um, who are looking to access the system. So I wanted to raise that for your consideration. One of the other concerns related to tech issues is the impact it has on your case. So one of the members gave the example of um, the assessor uploading a, a very, very large rebuttal um, case at the very last minute. And he was having difficulty downloading on that on his computer. And the board gave him the latitude to get the time to download it. But, but what he was really concerned about was the impression it left upon the board that he had to ask for that extra time, that they felt a little annoyed, that it was coming up at the end of the day. And ultimately, he was required to really truncate his rebuttal case in response to what had been uploaded because he was trying to be sensitive to the technical issues that had really slowed things down. So I think that's some of the, the practical experiences that people are sharing um, with remote hearings. One of the other big things that I'm hearing from our membership is the multiple platforms and the different rules are very difficult to navigate. Uh, every county has a different set of rules. Most counties have a different platform. Um, and here, you know, I'm, we're hearing loud and clear from the counties uh, the desire that they have the ability to create platforms and rules that fit their county. And certainly we agree to that. However, I think to the extent that there can be uniformity layered on top of that where reasonable, we really do look to the board to seek out those opportunities because having different rules and different platforms is really, really difficult on the taxpayers and the tax agents. So here we're looking for additional guidance and perhaps best practices. As a complement to that, one of the things that we wanted to raise for the board's consideration was perhaps having the BOE step in and offer to counties a uniform platform that can be used by many counties. So for the medium to smaller counties in particular, one of the things that we heard when we did meetings last year was the inability to fund and develop a platform that was sufficiently sophisticated to enable remote hearings. And as COVID has drug on, inevitably the backlog has drug on. So here the thought would be that the BOE could look to a model like LA County that has commissioned a specific use of WebEx and created a portal for their remote hearings and to act as the licensing party for that and allowing counties to use that platform so that there's not only uniformity but accessibility to all of the counties that want to implement remote hearings. So that was one thing we wanted to raise additionally for your consideration. Um, a couple more points on cons. There are some issues still with visibility and audio issues. I know we spent a lot of time last year speaking about the need to be able to see and hear people in real time. We are still having some experiences in certain counties where when you have parties in the same room, especially the case where you have the board in the same room and the assessor in the same room, people are wearing masks to comply with the health protocols, which is certainly understandable. But as an inevitable result of that, it's very difficult for people to understand who's speaking, who they're responding to. Um, so the wearing of masks in remote hearings has really been a hindrance in many cases. So to the extent that people could be spread out so that masks weren't uh, required, that would be encouraged. But certainly understand that's something that would have to be done within the health protocols of every county. Um, many count, well, a handful of counties, Riverside and Santa Barbara came up in my interviews with various members as counties that really had severe visibility issues. And my understanding is that really is produced by the fact that they're in very, very large hearing rooms and the cameras at the very, very end of the room. And so what happens is you can see a few of the board members, I believe in Riverside, it was told you can see two of three board members and one assessor personnel, but you can't see anything else. And it's a bird's eye view, if you will. So that seems to be a large problem. Um, additional to that, there's sort of 
one or a series of mics that don't work well. So many people couldn't be heard that were speaking and it was unclear sort of who was speaking, whether it could be heard or whether it couldn't be heard. So still definitely some technical issues to be mindful of there. Um, in terms of evidence presentation, many of the members had um, difficulty and felt that hearings were slowed down by having the clerk in control of the exhibits that were being presented on the screen and suggested that control and sharing of screens be ceded to the party that is actively presenting its case. So that rather than having to say, dear Madam Clerk, please open up exhibit three to page three, please zoom in a little bit, please move out, that you would have that control at your fingertips there. Um, and then finally, with regard to uh, visual, audio, evidentiary type issues, we do agree that not having everything in print real time can be very difficult, especially for the cases that tend to be more complex. Uh, not only board members and assessors, but taxpayers tend to write on the exhibits, not only to keep track of what exhibit number has been assigned to that particular exhibit, but to take notes on things that they want to discuss or ask the witnesses. Um, so that is a quick recap of sort of the cons that we're seeing. So now if it's okay with the board, what I'd like to do is to move on to the three points that Tom Parker from LA County made, um, requesting some revisions by the BOE. And I know that there were certain counties that sort of echoed those concerns, but perhaps before I move on to that next chapter, I'll pause there to ask if anybody has any questions. Seeing no hands, I think you can continue. OK, great. So the first point um, that I heard was the concerns related to choice of hearing format between in-person and remote hearings and whether or not due process really supports the idea that taxpayers have a choice for the type of hearing. And from our perspective, we think choice of hearings and not being forced into a remote hearing is absolutely critical to due process and the due process rights of all taxpayers, especially under the requirements of property tax rule 302A1, which requires not only a timely hearing, but a meaningful hearing. So if you think about, as we have sort of said throughout this process, if you think about what a remote hearing would look like in the context of a complex case, I think you run into many, many issues. Trying to compare exhibits, for example, when screen sharing doesn't quickly facilitate that, um, really is a hindrance in not only cross-examining witnesses where you need them to compare the exhibits, but where you really need the board to have a number of exhibits open at a time to be able to explain how things flow through. So let me give you a concrete example. When I do um, business property, uh, personal property cases related to audits, a lot of times one of the foundational things that I'm doing and setting up my case is working from, you know, the books and records to the fixed asset listing to what was reported on the 571L to what was in the work papers to what resulted in the audit adjustments. And it isn't uncommon for me to have that whole series of exhibits out in front of the board so that I can show them exactly how it ties together and really trying to get a level and depth of understanding of something that complex. And that's just one very small example you cannot do through a remote hearing. And if I was forced to do that type of case through a remote hearing, I really query whether or not I could protect adequately the taxpayers due process rights to present their case. And as Mr. I believe it was Tom Parker and others may have said, the Assessment Appeals Board acts as the trial court for property tax appeals. And so the due process rights in not only creating a record, but really ensuring the board's understanding of your case is absolutely critical. And here with related to, to choice, we heard some really extreme examples. One example from LA, and I believe it was another example from San Diego County, 
where the taxpayer demanded an in-person hearing, but also wouldn't sign a waiver. I, I agree that counties should not be held hostage by the choice of a hearing and really held um, in that way. But those are truly extreme examples. And I don't think that we should be punishing every taxpayer because of these extreme examples. Rather, what I'd like to see is um, you know, a requirement that a waiver be signed. Richard Moon suggested that a waiver would be required if you're going to seek a choice of an in-person hearing. So I'd like to see that we push in, in that regard and look to solutions that would still retain a choice for a, a, the format of hearing that you'll use rather than saying taxpayers have no choice because I don't think that adequately protects due process. Moving on to uh, the second point, which really related to timeliness of postponement requests. Again, we heard from Richard Moon shortly before I began my presentation that Rule 323, which governs postponement requests and continuances, really still is in place. And I think that that is a key to keep in mind here. The LTA is very clear that postponement requests are subject to Rule 323. When we spoke last year, we all sort of came to the consensus that we were seeking to mirror in-person hearings to the extent possible and that the rules governing remote hearings should be the same as in-person hearings. Here, I think we have rule 323 that governs postponements and should continue to do so. Finally, on the third point, submission of late evidence. Here, I think really we again need to try and mirror in person where many times having hearings and evidence submitted at the last minute it causes delays that happens the same thing happens in person so the best that we can do is to try and create platforms and portals that facilitate the technological end of submissions and here again i think with the boe potentially assisting with some of the technology perhaps we'll see a little bit less of the technological issues but here we would really need a proposal in front of us to see what it is that the counties were seeking in terms of adding teeth to the requirement that uh, evidence be submitted at, at least three three days or two days before the hearing so uh, I, I tried to keep it brief. Thank you for bearing with me. A lot of, a lot of ground to cover, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I have one quick one while I'm waiting to see if anybody else steps up. Uh, sure. First of all, thank you. I, I think you did a great job in kind of surmising and then also giving us your input on what you heard so far. And you mentioned, I guess, the CADA survey results showed that LA County had the best remote hearing format and that their processes work well for all parties. Are you suggesting that if funds were available, other counties should use LA as the general model to provide greater uniformity? Yes, I think that that's a fair statement. Um, you know, every platform, every process could always use improvement. But I think as a basic model, the platform, the portal that we're seeing and the practices we're seeing that the clerks implement uh, when they're administering remote hearings have been very well regarded and should be modeled by other counties. Thank you. Um, members, do we have any comments or questions of Ms. Robowski. Seeing and hearing none, let me, I oh, I see, uh, Member Cohen, um, yes, go ahead. I just ahead. wanted to thank you for your, your really thoughtful presentation. Um, I like how you had it organized between the pros and the cons, and it is um, very, very well uh, thought out. Let me ask a couple questions. Um, clearly, it appears that universally the counties experience traditional transitioning growing pains and in rolling out remote hearings. However, it appears that with time, with their acceptance, that they're able to solve them. And granted, I hear heard what you also said about how each county had, there's different rules, so on and so forth. Yeah, but that's par for the course. That's with yep. any item, any, you know, any situation. So um, I don't necessarily know if that's a strong enough 
con, but I, I receive it knowing that small counties also have limited resources and, um, you know, technology and maybe even personnel to, to juggle all of this. So can I, um, can I, can you, can you explain to me a little bit how they've been able to accept and to, I don't know, overcome the challenge that you, that you laid, laid out? Yeah, I think a lot of what we've seen is improvement over time because the protocols have become more clear. They've been distilled to writing. They've been available to people. So the expectation as a taxpayer, a tax agent walking into a remote hearing, notwithstanding the different rules and different procedures of the counties, have really allowed for the remote hearings to go more smoothly. I think where there continues to be real issues in the way that remote hearings are conducted and in taxpayer experiences are when those protocols are not transparent, they're not known ahead of time, and there hasn't been sufficient experience working through things like technological issues, which is why we're suggesting that the BOE play a central role in perhaps developing a platform and providing training around use of that platform and document submission. I think that would greatly expedite um, the adoption of remote hearings and the experiences of all counties conducting those hearings. Thank you. Um, no other questions. Thank you. Uh, members, any other questions? Oh, I see. Member Gaines, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank you, uh, Rianne, for your presentation. Very, uh, very clearly laid out. And um, you had made, I want to cue in again on LA County. Um, you had mentioned, uh, is, is it WebEx software? It is, yes. Using? Okay, and you said if that were made available to other counties, that that would provide, that that would actually help with the, the submission of evidence, that there would be kind of one pathway and it'd be easier to, to upload information. So how, how, do you, how do you make that happen? What is your, suggestion how would how would counties participate in that so certainly there's a lot of research to be done in coordination with la this is sort of just a suggestion that would have to be further vetted but i'd imagine that it would start with a discussion with la county and truly understanding how they came to develop their platform and the protocol or a portal rather sorry that they use for document submission I'd imagine that they had something custom built for them for this purpose. So it'd be a matter of getting your arms around what that looks like and then perhaps talking with those vendors about how do you go about licensing that same technology and what is the cost associated with that? Is it something that could be offered to all 58 counties? Is it a licensure requirement county by county? Um, and working with the vendor to see what that looks like. I think then it would be a matter of making that available to the counties that were interested in doing that and backstopping it finally with training for the clerks, for the assessors, for the taxpayers, led by the BOE about how you would most efficiently use that technology. Okay, yeah, I just I think that's a, a great idea. I'd love to hear from uh, Mr. Parker and others uh, as we proceed forward in the hearing, uh, just to see, and, and um, Mr. Dronenberg too, uh, with the Assessors Association in terms of how that might become a reality if it, if it all makes sense. So thank you very much, appreciate it. Of course. I see Vice Chair Schaefer. Um, uh, Mr. Mlowski, I'm very impressed with your presentation and even more impressed with the resume you bring to what you're talking about. Uh, you're a very credible witness and uh, very knowledgeable and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Schaefer. Seeing, Mr. Chair, perhaps oh, we Ms. can yeah, ask. Yeah, Member um, Cohen, go ahead. Yeah, per, perhaps we can ask um, the counties to also to 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 weigh in to, for each of them to highlight for us um, 
the identified advantages given by your, your AABs and participate uh, and, and participants um, very similar to what um, um, Ms. Brianna, forgive me, I can't pronounce your last name, so I don't want to be disrespectful. Rubowski. Rubowski. Oh, Ms. Rubowski <laughs> has provided. I thought it was a really easy way to um, wrap, begin to wrap our mind around the pros and the cons. And so, um, Mr., if we could go back to the county representatives. Thank you, Brianna. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. Yes, uh, I was going to ask if there's other members uh, from the working group first, if there's anybody out there that's listening or that's logged in with us. By all means, this is uh, here's your opportunity. Marcy Bookman so, retired from Santa Clara County. Yes, um, go ahead. I appreciate Ms. Rabowski's suggestion that perhaps uh, Los Angeles is system, which I believe they put together on themselves building on WebEx, uh, possibly be maybe available for other counties. Where I defer with Ms. Rabowski would be mandating that across all the counties. Um, each county, their clerks have their own system that they're familiar with. In many or most cases, I believe it's the same system that they use when they're doing their clerk duties for the Board of Supervisors and the counties have licensed a particular program. So for example, those counties that use WebEx, WebEx for the Board of Supervisors probably also use it for their AABs. Those that use Microsoft Teams or Zoom use that for their teams. And there would be additional expense in having to license additional software, uh, additional clerk time and training and lack of overlap. And additionally, if the state board were to require that, they'd also have to provide the IT support because a county that, for example, uses Microsoft Teams or Blue Jeans or something else isn't going to have the IT expertise to help out the clerks if suddenly something goes down in a proprietary LA WebEx system. So while I would think it would be a wonderful thing if that system were available for other counties who wish to use it, I would be opposed to mandating it. And I support the proposals that Ms. Rabowski and LA made about putting some teeth to some of the guidelines the state board promulgated with respect to hearings. Uh, for example, uh, if you what don't have your evidence turned in. You see. Oh. So for example, if uh, evidence wasn't turned in three days before the remote hearing is required, I would think that an appropriate remedy would be that there would be automatically uh, an extension and tolling of the two year statute so that the hearing could be continued uh, so that everything wasn't held up because people disobeyed the rules and didn't turn their evidence on t in on time. Um, and similarly, people shouldn't be held hostage uh, as both Ms. Rabowski and Mr. Parker agreed. Um, if someone is trying to abuse uh, uh, opponents by saying that they won't appear either remotely or in person. So there should make sure to be keys for that. And I would be in agreement with both of them on that. Thank you. Thank you. I see a couple other hands up, but before I move on to the hands, uh, Vice Chair Schaefer, you might want to mute your mic. Uh, I see uh, Ms. Stowers, your hand up. Thank you, Chair Vasquez. I want to say thank you to all the presenters so far, um, the clerks, the county representatives, and the taxpayer representative. Great, great job. Um, regarding the technology and the platform, it would be great if they were all on the same platform and it was easy to use. But I just want to warn the board members, and I'm not sure if you guys know, and we're just taking in information, but if we were to mandate something like that, that would be a state mandate and the state would have to cover the county's cost. So keep that in mind. Thank you for that. Uh, and I see a hand, I believe it's Ann Moore, is that correct? Yes, from San Diego County. I just wanted to note, I know as one of the, the larger counties that while I am super envious of LA County's custom system, um, they're large to a scale that none of us else are. So while they're taking in 18,000 filings a year, we 
as one of the larger counties, our 3,000 to 4,000 is dwarfed by that. We're still at a sixth of the level. So they have the staff and the resources to handle that. And dropping us into their software system is not going to solve all of the problems um, where we're magically able to support the same level that LA is. So we, we do use um, some of the same breakout rooms and techniques that that they that was described as for LA but it, we would need staff to support as well we would need additional tech support it, it our budget doesn't just would not just allow us to just take on this new system and everything would change overnight um, so I think LA is a special case and it, it should surely be used as something to strive for but I don't think it can be our standard Thank you. Uh, Member Gaines, I see your hand up, but let me just go to, uh, I believe it's Alina Gasparina. Thank you. Yes, Alina Gasparina with LA County. I just wanted to um, make a couple of comments um, on what Ms. Rabowski, um, on her comments. First, I wanted to say thank you, of course, to the big kudos to LA County. We have truly um, worked very hard in you know developing a pretty convenient system that mimics as closely possible to in-person hearing so th thank you for that um you know Ms. Rabowski made some valuable points of course um and her presentation was very well put um but i did have a few comments um on, on some of the pros and cons um so some of the cons i know she, you know she made a comment about you know the fear of taxpayers feeling like a denial of application due to technical issues. Um, that personally has not happened in LA County. I don't believe to my knowledge. Um, the LTA is pretty clear on that. Um, however, the only you know thing is there's, you know, it, it, the circumstance matters as well. Um, there's been instances where we've received, um, you know, the hearing notices have gone out, everything has been confirmed, WebEx invites have been issued, um, as well as the appointment cards that go out. Um, but what happens is sometimes they don't sign in and then four hours later or whatever the case may be, you know, we get calls saying, hey, we were trying to sign on, we had technical issues. So in those circumstances, of course, it's pretty hard, um, you know, to 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 say that okay the person was attempting in good faith to get on um of course there's still reinstatements rights as well um you know but as she said of course that's another burden on them to go through so you know i think it has to be within reason you know if someone is truly having technical issues and we we have it of course it happens everywhere um the person signs on we have them telephone in you you know you address the board and the board will more often than not um, grant the continuance, of course, due to the tech issues. Um, we also are faced sometimes with other scenarios where the person, you know, a lot of the times many of the members, including the clerk, feel like the person um, is kind of using that to their advantage because their case isn't ready to go forward. Um, so we just kind of want a fair playing field, you know, on both sides. You know, of course, we definitely understand the issues for taxpayers. So I, I did want to highlight that. Um, and, you know, one of the examples I think Ms. Rabowski gave about, you know, feeling rushed um, because there were some technical issues and an upload of, you know, a large amount of data from the assessor, you know, and the agent feeling like they kind of had to cut their short. Um, I completely understand. I would probably feel the same way. But I think that, you know, in that case, you know, as we say, it's really up to you. There's been times where, um, you know, a rebuttal evidence has been uploaded um, just like as it would be presented in person and the other party requests, you know, hey, this is 500 pages. We don't believe 30 minutes is ample time. And that's again up to the board for you to voice that concern um, and for the board to, to grant that request. More often than not, of course, it's reasonable 500 page. You know, we've recently been faced with that scenario where the board did grant the continuance. Um, and in some cases, you know, we've still had, you know, the agent or the taxpayer refuse to sign waivers. And that puts us in a very challenging situation where we're trying to work with you um, to grant the postponement, to grant the continuance because you're working on issues, gathering documents, but they're refusing to sign a time waiver. So, so we're in a very hard spot in those situations. Um, she also made a comment about sharing of screens, um, you know, documents on the screen. Correct. Currently, 
our clerk is um, sharing the document and, you know, the agent will say, you know, please present exhibit, you know, F on page, whatever. Yes, of course, I think this is, you know, challenging both for the, you know, the party who's presenting as well as for our clerks. Um, I would love more than anything to kind of hand um, the screen over, um, which we can in WebEx, you know, but then there comes this um, issue uh, or concern we have had instances, you know, if you give someone control of sharing their screen, sometimes it's possible they'll share something they're not supposed to share. Um, and I think that's been one of the biggest concerns that our departmental information security officer has had. And that's why, you know, even though it's, it's challenging for, I think, both sides, we've kind of stuck to, you know, having the clerk have that control just to make sure um, the correct document is being shared. If it's confidential, it's not shared. And the person doesn't actually accidentally share something on their you know computer or desktop that they shouldn't share um and lastly i kind of wanted to touch on you know of course i was a first speaker and i you know i you know i wanted to let tom kind of present la's la's case as far as the lta goes um and i agree with mr bowski on things of course being fair um and i do think we need some teeth on that lta of course within reason you know and i know the lta does state that rule 323 postponements being granted However, you know, for example, for LA County, um, postponements being requested within, you know, the 21 day period. Yes, of course, those, you know, we review and grant. But LA County's board rules also allow, you know, for subsequent other than the first time matter of right postponement, as well as a postponement request being made less than 21 days, as long as there's good cause. You know, the LTA um, at the end of that, you know, the rights of hearing participants does highlight um, you know, of course, it's due process, you know, for them to request an in-person hearing um, and it's reasonable cause. We have had many instances where we've had um, taxpayers, agents, whatever the case may be, um, request the in-person hearing two days prior to the hearing and sometimes even during the hearing, citing the LTA saying this is my right, plain and simple. Um, and we're constantly faced with that situation where, you know, they'll request a postponement, even though notices have gone out 45 days prior, we've gone through the administrative functions, the time, money, resources that we spend, taxpayer money, um, scheduling, and then two days before we get, you know, a request for in person due to, you know, we don't feel comfortable with this platform. We deny the request because we're citing Rule 323, but they come to the hearing and address the board. And again, you know, the board feels like they're in a position where they don't want to, you know, it's a fine line of due process. And I think that's our biggest challenge. We, we definitely agree that everything should be fair on, on both sides, but um, I just don't think we have that, you know, as Ms. Moore said, you know, very well, we don't have that empowerment um, to kind of um, sink our teeth into. Um, and, you know, of course, to the last, you know, and we're very fortunate, of course, in LA County, as I said, to have the influx of money and resources to develop this system, you know, but unfortunately, as you know, Anne Moore said, some of the other counties don't, unfortunately. So a one size fits all platform system, unfortunately, would just not be fair to some of those other counties. Thank you again for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts and comments. Uh, Member Gaines. Yes, I want to thank Alina Kasparian for her presentation. And I'm just curious as to, in terms of that WebEx software that you developed, uh, I'm, and I'm talking voluntarily, would, would it make sense for other counties to see what LA has done? And uh, is there an opportunity for other counties to use it? I, after hearing the comments by Ann Moore, uh, which is San Diego is a big county, so I now I'm questioning as to whether the software platform that LA County developed would make sense for other counties. I would like to clarify. Um, so web software WebEx is um, not something LA County developed. It's actually um, one of the bigger platforms used for teleconferencing, just like Microsoft Teams. We developed the, the portal that Ms. Rabowski was referring to where um, taxpayers and assessors would upload their documents um, and then be able to download um, as well in the day of. So WebEx is just that standardized system that we've used. We just felt like it worked well. Um, I have received updates that, you know, Microsoft Teams is also pretty 
pretty good as their Microsoft Teams is also allowing some of the, the features that Ms. Rabowski highlighted that mimics in-person hearing, such as creating um, breakout sessions. Like we can do that even probably right now in this meeting. Um, so I think, you know, both platforms would probably be acceptable. Okay, are they expensive? I mean, could a, could a smaller county uh, use one of those platforms, whether it's Teams or WebEx? I'm not sure on the price, to be honest. I know we've gone full licensing for LA County um, per users. There's, you know, we've got a certain amount number of accounts you can get licensed um, for a certain price. Um, I wouldn't know the details on that. Our, our IT, um, of course, has worked all of those details out. Right. Yeah, thank you for your comments. You're welcome. Thank you. Other members, uh, I. Member, Member Cohen, I see your hand. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Alina. I appreciate your presentation. Um, so, Chair, if I may, I just want to make sure that we spend some time on this um, postponement issue. Um, Brianne and Tom, I was curious, do we see any resolution that we can come to in this issue? It, it, it appears that the issues are clear, and I really welcome your feedback. Um, Member Cohen, this is Tom Parker. Yes. I would say that we need um, language that further clarifies and reinforces the obligation of parties to comply with 323 in the LTA, since that is the basic authority that uh, not just in Los Angeles, but especially in Los Angeles, we are seeing brandish as authority for misusing you know the right to a postponement and the only other clarification i would offer is that the three points i talked about and other folks have commented on they are not just los angeles requests for lta you know language those are caceo based requests for language not just los angeles thank you So I think on behalf of taxpayers, reinforcing the requirement to comply with three, Rule 323 makes a lot of sense and I think is something that's difficult to argue against. Um, I, I do think that there are certain situations outside of a, abuse where clerks would still need to be flexible. Um, I could foresee, for example, um, uh, you know, a in-person hearing being scheduled and there being, a, for example, the Delta variant flare up that may that's something that can change on a dime, if you will. That's something that you may not know in advance. So I would really encourage the board and the clerks to remain flexible in those certain situations. But I do realize that those are reasonable requests. I think where we have unreasonable requests, where people are really wielding and abusing the ability to call um, postponements because of uh, a choice of format is something that we can protect against. If the platform was known to be virtual far enough in advance, to me, and this may not necessarily be popular against you know all, all taxpayers, but but if you knew that far enough in advance to then say two days prior to the hearing, oh, I want in person, there better be a good reason why you've shifted your request because otherwise it does look like abuse. So my message to the board here is, I think bringing some teeth to postponements within reason is acceptable, but I really want to underscore that it has to be within reason and we shouldn't be creating broad brushstroke requirements that go beyond Rule 323 to cater to these extreme experiences. Thank you. Oh, and I'm sorry, one quick point of clarification on the platform. Um, our suggestion is not that it be mandated or required among the counties, but rather that it be provided as an option for counties to use. And truly the intent was access to technology, recognizing that many counties were referencing the lack of funds and the lack of staffing. 
that would really enable the efficient use of remote hearings. So here, the suggestion is to lean on technology so that you can have better experiences with less staff and pool funding uh, through the use of that technology. Thank you. Thank you, and just for the record, that was Ms. Roboski speaking at the end there. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Seeing and uh, Mr. Chair, Ms. Just Member wanna, Cohen, yes, go ahead. Just want to point out that it's uh, twelve forty-nine, and I think I, I'm with you on that one. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank I was you. just trying to wrap this up, and actually, I, I know before we close, I, I think we still have to ask AT and T if there's anybody on the line, and then we'll definitely take our break here. Yes. Um, this is Ms. Taylor, AT&T moderator. Can you let us know if there is anyone who would like to make a public comment on this matter? OK, once again, if you'd like to make a public comment, please press 1, then 0. 1, 0. And we do not have anyone in queue for a comment. Thank you. Uh, yes, members, I was hoping to have it right at 1230, but you know, we had some real robust discussions, so I didn't want to cut it off. Uh, but with that, uh, let's go ahead and take a lunch break. How long, uh, you know, last, I, I, I was remiss yesterday. I just assumed 15 minutes was long enough, but I didn't even bother to ask staff. Is, is that sufficient or do people want like a 30 minute break for lunch? What's the preference? Chairman Vasquez and honorable yes. members, this is Brenda Fleming. Um, I think staff would appreciate a 30 minute break. Uh, I was kind of thinking that these things behind the scenes. Yeah, they would. They, I'm sure they would greatly appreciate it. Uh, so that said, 30 minutes would be uh, fine with us. OK, why don't we why don't we do that? I, I see it's 10 to 1, so I guess we Oh, M member Cohen, yes. Yeah, before we break, I just want to ask that Tom and Brianne that um, that if, if possible, if they could offer some suggested language to us um so that we can begin to incorporate it uh that would help solve some of the challenges that they have that's Good it point thank okay. you uh so okay. with that uh we can take a break we'll take our lunch break and let's reconvene at 1 20. that gives us a good half hour okay see you in 30 minutes okay we're all back here uh, Ms. Taylor, are you with us? Yes, I am. If you could please uh, call our next item, which I believe is sub item E. Yes, our next item is sub item E, impact of possible transition plans for in-person AAB hearings. The four speakers on this sub item are Thomas Parker, Deputy County Counsel, Los Angeles County, Honorable Ernest Dronenberg, Jr., President, CAA, and San Diego County Assessor, Recorder, Clerk. Brianne Rabowski, Chair, Ad Hoc Committee on Remote Hearings, with CADA and partner, Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman. And David Young, Deputy Director, Property Tax Department, California State Board of Equalization. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Taylor, we'll introduce you in the order your names are listed on the agenda. Please state your name and who you represent for the record. With that, Ms. Taylor, if you would begin. Thank you. We will begin with Mr. Thomas Parker. Are you available, Mr. Parker? Yes, Ms. Taylor, thank you very much. My name is Tom Parker, Deputy County Counsel for Los Angeles County and I am the AAB Council. I am representing as well the CA CEO in this proceeding as I have throughout the past two days. Um, thank you to Chair Vasquez and all members of the board for the opportunity to speak today. It's been a very joy enjoyable experience and very valuable for everyone involved. Regarding the impact of possible transition plans, you've already heard from Ms. Kasparian's uh, prior testimony earlier today what the plans for Los Angeles County are, so I won't repeat what you've already heard. Um, I will 
offer my very general comment as a, a legal counsel, not as one who administers it on a daily basis, of course, that the impacts are going to be very dependent on the circumstances of each county, given its number of appeals, its budget, and its staffing, and its population size, in short, all of its resources. Um, so I, I think it's, in my view, it's impossible to offer any global statement about what the impacts of possible transition plans uh, for in-person AABs will hear. As you have heard, some counties are going to keep remote as well as in-person. Some have already, since COVID has relaxed a little bit, gone back to all in-person. Some are doing hybrids. Again, each county has to decide in its circumstances what is best for that county AAB program. Um, I, I will offer as well the comment that regardless of the particular practical impacts, given revenue and tax code 1616, I would venture to offer the view that it is absolutely uh, legal by statute for a county to offer in-person as well as remote, the so-called hybrid program, or do one or the other, whatever it deems best under its circumstances. Um, and uh, beyond, beyond that, um, I, I don't know what else to tell the board on this particular topic. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Taylor, you want to move on to the next one? Because I don't see any hands up right now. Certainly. Our next speaker will be Honorable Ernest J. Dronenberg, Jr. Um, chairman and board members, um, the uh, the title of this is the possible transition um, in some counties, they're are not going to need to translate because they're already there. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, the assessors generally are supportive of, of the current um, situation. And if uh, more people want to transition, you know, it, it's not really an issue with the assessors. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments from either one of our speakers so far? If not, uh, Ms. Taylor, I, well, I guess we could just let, if anybody's on the line from our working group that wishes to ask either one of our speakers, this is the opportunity to do so. not seeing or hearing any. Uh, Ms. Taylor, do we do we have any written comments on this? Well, we have a couple more speakers. Oh, I'm sorry. Go yes, our, yes, our next speaker is Brianne Rabowski. Hello again. Um, I'll just echo some of the comments that I made on the last item. Um, which is we think remote hearings are very helpful for many types of administrative matters and certain evidentiary matters. So as we transition to uh, a post-COVID world, we would encourage the continued use of remote hearings where appropriate for these types of matters. We do think that it's efficient and streamlines the process and indeed helps with the backlog. So I agree with Mr. Parker from a legal perspective, RNTC code 1616 does allow for the continued use of remote hearings and we would in fact encourage it and ask that additional counties consider adopting remote hearings for these types of matters. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Mr. David Young of the State Board of Equalization. Yes, good afternoon all. This is David Young, Deputy Director of the uh, 
property tax department. I, I actually do not have much to add to, to the comments already made. The, the, uh, we've covered quite a wide range of, <clears throat> of situations within the county. Some have never transitioned to remote hearings and some have and I've already trans I've already basically uh, um, gone back to in person and where I am what I am really interested in is the ones that are planning on offering hybrid we've already heard some testimonies that hybrid in my mind a hybrid hearing is where we both where a county offers both the ability to have part of it in remotely and part of it in person. And I would imagine that would require even more resources than a pure remote or a pure in person. Is there any, is there any other than the one county, are there any others that are planning on doing that? And if they are, is there anything needed from the board on that? So that's, that's, that's my only uh, comment or question to any of our previous uh, uh, presenters. Thank you. Um, seeing no hands, Mr. Well, Chair. Like Mr. Parker, Mr. Parker, go ahead. In response to Mr. Young, um, I would, Kata made a suggestion um, in its paper, in its letter, on these issues to uh, to the state board that has some some merit if the state board could find a way to uh, assist in making it happen and that is obtaining state funding i'm grossly paraphrasing here but of helping assist in getting state funding for counties that don't have the resources on their own to uh, be able to perhaps create an ability to have a remote hearing process for their counties. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. I see Mr. McGibbon in the queue. Did you have a question or comment or no? I think you're muted though. Thank you. Uh, I just had a comment uh, uh only a handful of the responding counties specifically mentioned using hybrid but several did so there is some some interest in that uh no one mentioned it being um requiring more resources though than say just a, a remote hearing um, and, and back to the, the, the notion of, of what the transition is going to be like, the transition is going to be dictated a lot by your board's action on the proposals that we, we presented. So um, to the extent those can be accommodated, it will facilitate, I think, uh, more remote, more use of remote hearings. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I, and I, I think Ms. Roboski has a comment. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on what Mr. Parker suggested and, and pointed out in Kata's letter. We do believe that it would be helpful for the BOE to assist counties in adopting remote hearings. And I believe that some of the discussion we began with about talking about sourcing technology for those counties or assisting counties in doing so, um, the state currently has additional funds beyond what they had expected for this fiscal year. So uh, we do think that it would be a good position for the BOE or good role for the BOE to play to support counties in adopting remote hearings. Um, to loop back to the ori original topic, which related to the transition period, one particular issue did come to mind, which I was uh, would be remiss if I didn't bring to the board's attention. I think as we go through this transition period, having adequate notice of the type of hearing that will be held is going to be absolutely essential for everybody, not only for clarity and administration and procedure, but also to protect everyone's rights in, um, in consenting to the type of hearing platform. We would hate to have 
a culture where we have these last minute postponement requests because it was unclear from the notice what type of platform was going to be used. So I had heard from a couple members in particular that counties that had gone back and forth between remote hearings, in-person hearings, back to remote hearings, and so on and so forth, that there were some notice issues. Thankfully, and much to the county's credibility, you know, credit, they were flexible in understanding that without adequate notice of the hearing type, people were at a disadvantage to understand what hearing they were consenting to. So long-winded way of saying it's really important that we keep our eye on the notice requirements and that it be very, very clear in the notice what type of hearing will be used. Thank you. Thank you for that input. <clears throat> Members, any other comments or questions of any of the speakers on this last panel? Seeing and hearing none. Oh, uh, Chair Schaefer. Oh, Vice I see. Vice Chair Schaefer. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, oh, I just want to thank all the participants for coming together. I feel like it's been a classroom for us, and they've all been the eminent scholars that have shared their experience uh, with us. Uh, we're all the better for it. And, uh, I, I hope that this is part of our agenda every year. And uh, I just want to say uh, I've appreciated my time today with each of them. Thank, Thank you. Ms. Taylor, did we have any written comment on this item? Chairman, we do not have any written comments. And I'm, I'm going to throw it out again to the all the other working uh, group members if they wish to ask a question or, or comment, this is the opportunity. And while we're waiting, uh, Ms. Taylor, if we could just check with AT&T if anybody's on the line. Certainly. AT&T moderator, can you let us know if there is anyone who would like to make a public comment on this matter? OK, if you'd like to make public comment, please press 1, then 0 at this time. 1, And we do not have anyone queuing up. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, members, uh, although I see Ms. Robosky on our my screen, uh, wait, did you want to do a follow up on that? I did. I just I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time, but I did want to be responsive to member Cohen's request for proposed language on some of those items. So I, I don't know if you wanted to talk about next steps with respect to proposed language now, or if that'll be a, a separate item that you'll take up. Member Cohen, were you thinking of, of incorporating now or waiting until the end? Um, I was. I'm open to it. So I would be open to what you have to say now, Brianna, since we're here. Brianna, excuse me, since we're here and discussing it. And also, like I said, really interested in the language. Now, I know Tom submitted language already in the pan, but I wanted something that maybe would incorporate everyone's some everyone's concerns. Yeah, so I, I thought about it over the lunch break, and I think in putting together proposed language, my respectful suggestion would be that we go through a process similar to what we did with the LTA where I'm happy to work with Tom in coming together with proposed language or alternatively that I come up with on behalf of CADA proposed language that can be vetted by our board and our officer group. Um, and that that then be considered by this group. I think many, many issues that were raised today related to postponements, to evidence submission are very sensitive topics that really need to be thoroughly considered and the language will have to be quite precise. So I, I want some time to draft that language. I, and I also think it's important that there be allowed public comment on it because these are things that are really going to heavily impact the fabric of the property tax system and assessment appeals board hearings. So my respectful suggestion is that we come up with a timeline to submit proposed language and a plan to further vet and discuss that language with this working group. Okay, it's perfect. Actually, also what I was going to also do is just have my staff follow up directly, like you with Tom, um, maybe a few other folks. 
just just to, te to check in with you, but I appreciate the more thoughtfulness that you uh, believe that the subject matter requires, and I really appreciate the timeline. So we'll keep talking. Thank you. Great. Mr. Chair, we can continue moving. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call our next sub item, which I believe is F. Yes, our next item is sub item F, possible issues for additional guidance regarding remote AAB hearings. Our speakers will be Thomas Parker, Ernest Dronenberg Jr., Brianne Rabowski, and David Young. Our first Thank you. speaker. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go with our first speaker. Go ahead. Our first speaker will be Mr. Thomas Parker. Are you available? I'm right here. Yes. Um, Chair Vasquez, honorable members of the board. Um, I will try and be brief on this point. I, I had a phone call during the lunch hour, lunch half hour with Ms. Rabowski, and we discussed and agreed to what she indicated a moment ago for the record. As far as possible issues for additional guidance, um, I would respectfully offer further language in the LTA regarding remote hearings on the topics we've been discussing today, and that was already essentially uh, mentioned. Additionally, what Mr. McKibben also mentioned, State Board of Equalization support in amending Government Code 25105 and 105.5 regarding the retention and creation of records. That would be a good way to not spend taxpayer money needlessly in CACEA's view. And that is also referenced in our prior letter of, I believe, September 16th to the State Board. So that those are the possible issues for additional guidance that the CACEO sees as useful for uh, additional guidance regarding remote hearings. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Ernest Dronenberg, Jr. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I don't think I've got anything further to say. Um, I think we've covered all the issues that relate to this, and now it's just the hard work of making choices. But I'm sure glad it's you, not me. And uh, uh, so I would thank you for this opportunity and suggest go to the next speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brianne Rabowski. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of it has already been covered. I agree largely with Tom that the LTA should cover the things that were discussed today. I do think there are a few best practices that perhaps could be added to the LTA. And maybe what we'll do is we'll add that to the suggested proposed language that Ms. Cohen has requested of us. So we'll include some best practices to be considered there, being sensitive to the fact that we are attempting to balance not only uniformity and equity, but also flexibility for the counties to be able to administer their hearings as they see fit. So we will be sensitive to that fact. But I think if we cover those items, uh, we'll be well served with BOE guidance. We haven't yet discussed, but we could also consider perhaps at a later date, um, including as part of ongoing BOE audits of counties, um, sort of the practices that are being used for remote hearings. I think that's heavily dependent on how the transition goes from where we are today to what it looks like six months to a year from now. If remote hearings become a fixture truly in the property tax system within California, we may look to the BOE to perform audits to make sure that some of the foundational requirements for due process and otherwise are being met. Um, but I think that's something for a future discussion. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. David Young. 
Yes, <clears throat> yes, good afternoon again. Um, I have truly appreciated everybody's um, testimony today and have taken copious notes and, and believe we have a good understanding of, of some of the issues that are in play and look forward to the process of, um, of, of revisiting RLTA. That, so thank you very much. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions of any of the speakers so far? I have one, just one quick one of uh, Mr. Parker. First of all, thank you, Mr. Parker. But just a quick clarification. Uh, since LA County has face-to-face -face interaction among all parties in their virtual hearings now, what would be the major difference for the in-person hearings when we restart them? I think the major difference, sir, would be, well, two two differences. We would be holding it the hearings back at the uh, county building on Temple Street in person, which is an obvious one, but I'll state it for the record. And, and secondly, we would have to comply, of course, with all the public health orders that are applicable at the time to the in-person hearings in Los Angeles. Uh, there are still a few of those public health requirements uh, lurking in Los Angeles County at any rate from our public health department. And I'm not going to try and guess five, six months from now what will or will not be in force in terms of those requirements. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just see if there's any other members with any comments or questions. Seeing none, how about anybody from our working group? Um, this is your opportunity also to ask any questions or comments. And while we're waiting for that, Ms. Taylor, do we have any written comments on this? We do not have any written comments. Why don't we go ahead and check with AT&T to see if anybody's on the line. AT&T moderator, can you let us know if there is anyone who would like to make a public comment on this matter? Okay, and once again, if you'd like to make a public comment, please press one, then zero, one, zero. And we do not have anyone in queue. Thank you. With that, uh, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call our sub item G. The final item is sub item G, board wrap up and schedule for next steps. The speakers for the sub item are Antonio Vasquez, Chairman, California State Board of Equalization, District 3. Malia M. Cohen, Member, California State Board of Equalization, District 2. Brenda Fleming, Executive Director, California State Board of Equalization. Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, first of all, to all who participated in this work group for your tremendous expertise and valuable input in these recommendations, including the amount of time you set aside today. You have identified some important issues that need to be further developed and discussed at the board meeting in October. As the next step, I am asking you to continue as our work group members and also to submit in writing to our executive director specific language that you want to be considered in the LTA on the AAB's authority and discretion over remote hearings. In the interest of transparency, the ED will provide copies to all work group members and the board. While Mr. McKibben has already done this for the clerks, we will need to hear from CADA and any other stakeholders. I will ask the board for a motion directing the ED to review all the submissions and, pro and produce a draft LTA for the board and the work group to discuss in October. Before the board approves any LTA or takes other action, I think we need to ensure that all options submitted on each issue are considered and are where <clears throat> and are within hopefully 
a consensus. I've, identi I've identified two issues and I am sure that Member Cohen has more. Uh, first is the clarification of a taxpayer's due process rights to either a virtual or an in-person hearing and what that means. And the second one is time limits for document submissions. Uh, let me turn to my co-chair here, Member Cohen, and see if she has any other things she might want to use to wrap up or suggestions. Yes. Thank you. Member Cohen. Um, so first, colleagues, thank you for um, participating and sitting through this process, this hearing. And I really want to acknowledge um, two sets of folks. First, the BOE staff, I think they've always been impeccable. They do a hard, they do a lot of work. I also want to recognize our individual staff that are also part of this, that are shaping the hearings, that are um, doing the research, that are doing a lot of the follow-up. I want to acknowledge Regina Evans and John Thiella that did a heavy lift on making this hearing possible. And although I was off camera primarily uh, most of the hearing, I want to acknowledge that I've been listening and jotting down notes, as has my staff. And today we heard testimony from our stakeholders about the guidance that the board ha has given regarding rem remote assessment appeals board. And what's interesting about this board is, is that you have folks from different generations. Um, Schaefer is, likes to tell that he's the oldest and, I, and he likes to also tell that I'm the youngest. And what's interesting is, is I think between the two of us, the span of years allows us a very good perspective, a perspective to listen and to think critically. I am a proponent and support technology. I see it as an enhancement in increasing transparency. I see it as an enhancement in increasing um, access ability. Um, and I recognize that I, there are people who think like me and there are people who don't think like me. I also recognize that there are some real inherent challenges, big counties and small counties, rural, ag, uh, suburban, not everyone is, there's no cookie cutter approach. And so um, when I was listening to the presentations, I heard the pros and the cons. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for taking time out to be a part of this discussion. Many people joke and say, what is the Board of Equalization? And I always joke back saying, you know about the Board of Equalization or the AAB when you're in trouble and you have questions. That's when people become most knowledgeable and um, outreach to us. But nonetheless, in good times and bad times, I do think it's incumbent upon us to honor the oath that we took and also um, to make sure that we are providing the fiercest advocacy for all taxpayers, big and small. Um, so to the presenters, the views, concerns, and the feedback that you've presented here today will be taken seriously and will given serious, considerable, uh, uh, serious consideration. Um, I, um, I will stop there, but I just wanted to just close this uh, hearing out on a note of sincere gratitude. I appreciate, I can see that each presenter put in a lot of time and effort in making this presentation and uh, we are receiving it. And, um, and Mr. Chair, I turn the meeting back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call on our executive director, let me just check with the members, other members, if they have any additional input or comments before I turn to our executive director. Seeing and hearing none, Ms. Fleming, let me ask you to give us some of your wrap up thoughts and comments. Thank you, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members um, of the board. Uh, first of all, thank you and all of the participants who participated today at today's hearing. Um, your input and your feedback and the discussion have been tremendously helpful uh, to the board, um, to myself, uh, to my staff, for all of us um, who represent uh, a great uh, breadth and depth of, of talent, knowledge, and experiences in this property tax industry. I especially want to thank um, the Honorable Ernie Dronenberg, President of California Assessors Association and the San Diego County Assessor, along with Mr. John McKibben, Committee Chair of the California Association of Clerks and Election Officials, and Mr. Tom Parker, Deputy Counsel for Los Angeles County. 
for your participation, not just in today's hearing and discussion, but also in yesterday's meetings with us. So we appreciate your time. I believe today's hearing validated the board's uh, critical work and leadership that was provided to county boards of equalization and assessment appeals boards during the COVID-19 pandemic. The focus, attention, and guidance the board provided over the past year ensure the possibility of remote hearings while providing taxpayers the opportunity to have their cases adjudicated without further delay. The board's work assisted with the con continuity of business while protecting the health and welfare of all Californians. We all took that quite seriously. There have been a number of lessons learned over this past year in a lot of different realms, as I know we, we can probably all agree uh, in our professional and personal lives. Um, but the today's hearing gave us an opportunity to re-examine a specific area of lessons learned, and that's this AAB process. So I'd like to, again, thank you all, but just to note that we look forward to receiving the additional information um, so that we can take a closer examination of, of your feedback and your input. We'll review it, and as the board has just discussed, we'll take a look at that material, examine it, incorporate it into um, a draft, and share that back uh, with the board um, in, in terms of a proposed LTA. There are some things that I would like to, uh, and as a part of this process, I'd like to include the opportunity to talk with my staff and vet it internally so that we can take a look at not just what we heard today, but some of the additional and surrounding issues, uh, comparing it to existing law, other LTAs, so that we are, um, have the opportunity to do a comprehensive review in light of what we've heard today. So again, uh, members, uh, we can, uh, Chairman Vasquez and members with your permission can look at presenting that information possibly at the October meeting um, or possibly at the no November meeting if, uh, if it would give us a little bit more time to be more robust and thorough in our material. So if it would be at all um, considered by the board, if we could have until November, I think my staff would appreciate it because we, we've just been chatting as we've been listening and there's, uh, there's a lot of meat here. So we would like to have the opportunity to do our best work on, on behalf of this topic and, and the taxpayers that we, all, we are here to support. So members, again, thank you for your leadership in this area. Um, again, I appreciate the guests. It's been a phenomenal discussion. Uh, it's been a great, great pleasure to listen to the dialogue. So thank you all for your time and your attention to this matter. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Taylor, do we have any written comments on this item? We do not have any written comments. Can we check with AT&T if anybody's on the line that maybe wants to give their thoughts or ideas at this point? Sure. AT&T moderator. Can you let us know if there is anyone who would like to make a public comment on this matter? OK, once again, if you'd like to make a public comment, please press one, then zero. One, zero. And we do not have anyone queuing up. Thank you. Thank you, members. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion authorizing our work group members to continue and to submit in writing to the ED, our executive director, specific language that they want to be considered in the LTA on the AAB's authority and discretion over remote hearings? This is Deputy Controller Stowers. Yes. I make that motion. So Great. So it's been moved. And is that a second by Member Cohen? It's a second. I'd like to comment before we go. Um, sure, go ahead. Just to, to, to round out the closure. Go ahead. Um, well, you I, we already you already heard my my thank yous. I think uh, what I wanted to hear were some of the issues. Um, so some of the specific issues that we should address in our October board meeting, if that is possible. Um, uh, how do we address due process rights from parties? How do we deal with requests for postponements? How do we deal with reasonable requests for postponements versus unreasonable requests? Should written, written waivers be specifically required? Um, I have a host of other questions of, of, of wrap up that I'd like to be able to provide the board just so that it's a, in the public record. I just wanted to, 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 to insert that briefly before we close out with our vote, but also know that um, we'll be circling back with um, our summer summary of the of the meeting to each one of your offices. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to vote now. Thank you. Any other 
Oh, member Gaines. Just wanted to clarify that. Um, I want to make sure I understand it clearly, but. Are we going to make edits to the LTA? Uh, with respect to rule 323. We may at the end of the day. OK, so is that included um, in this uh, particular motion? Yes, I mean, my thought was that <clears throat> right now we're going to get people to submit specifically the, the yeah. members of the work group and anybody else that's been working with sure. us, the stakeholders, right? And then <clears throat> working with the staff, they'll create this LTA that they'll come back to us. And it sounds like I'm uh, listening to our executive director that it, it may not be October, it may be November now. Uh, <clears throat> but in any event, when it comes back to us, you, we all will have an opportunity, another yeah. stab at it, I guess. OK, that's great. Thank you. Correct, unless I'm hearing differently and I you see heads nodding. OK. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, so with that, uh, Ms. Taylor, if you could please call the roll. Yes, the motion on the floor is to authorize our work group members to continue and to submit in writing to the executive director specific language that they want to be considered in an LTA on the AAB's authority and discretion over remote hearings. Chairman Vasquez. You're muted, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, aye. Vice aye. Chair Schaefer. Aye. 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 Member Gaines. Aye. Member Cohen. Aye. Deputy Controller Stowers. Aye. So that's unanimous of all those present. Uh, with that, uh, let me just ask uh, the members once again if we have any. Well, you know what? <clears throat> Before we get into that, uh, if there's no further comments from anyone, we will close this public hearing officially now. And members, do we have any final remarks for the day? Seeing and hearing none. Let me. Oh, Member Gaines, go ahead before I wrap it up. I just wanted to wish my granddaughter Everly a happy second birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, Vice Chair Schaefer. Yes, thank you, um, Chair. Uh, uh, we have a couple of birthdays today. Uh, uh, we mentioned Tommy Lasorda yesterday, and actually today's actually day, and I mentioned it with uh, Mr. Parker. Uh, Debbie Boone, whose uh, dad I've got to know, Pat Boone, the singer, uh, she's turned 65 today. But what's important about today, uh, two are very important things, uh, neither one of which of those birthdays. Uh, today is the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation back in um, on, it took, it took place on January 1, 1863. But it was agreed upon and issued by President Lincoln on, the, on September 22nd, 1962, which is today's anniversary. And the thing that is most significant uh, today is we are journeying in memory of four Californians that we lost in Kabul uh, since our last meeting, which was on August 26th. Uh, we have uh, Nicole G. from Sacramento and Roosevelt, who is in Ted's district and he and I have talked about it. She, like all of them, were in their early 20s and uh, will never return again. Uh, we had three in my district. One was uh, Corporal Hunter Lopez, 22, whose mom and dad were both in the Sheriff's Department. Uh, his dad was in charge of Coachella Music Festival for the Sheriff's Department and his son, who we lost, spent three years in the uh, scouting patrol with the sheriff's department, planning to go to join his mom and dad as a full-time sheriff when he got home from the battles, and that will never happen. Um, and then we had uh, Kareem uh, Okoye, 20, uh, who last sent her folks a picture of her interacting with the kids in Kabul just before she was ambushed. Uh, Dylan Morola, 20th from Rancho Cucamonga, that's in my district. 
And then I mentioned, uh, uh, of course, Nicole G from uh, at Ted's district. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I think we're going to see fewer and fewer of the, the situation. So that's the shining light. And we continue to serve. And I think it's our duty to respect and promote those who have uh, given as they have. And uh, I try to do that, especially when it's somebody in our district or somebody in our state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, with that, I just wanted to thank the members, the AAB work group participants, Ms. Fleming, staff, for your continuing outstanding work on all this business we have handled today. And it's my understanding there's a couple happy birthdays here on the staff. Uh, first and foremost, we have Patty Lemson. Happy birthday. Uh, I believe it's her 21st birthday. And then we also have uh, Mr. Reno Ursula. He's with the County Assessed Property Tax Division. Happy birthday to both of you. Um, oh, and it, I understand it was Regina Evans' birthday on Monday. Happy belated birthday. And I would like to adjourn this meeting uh, once again, in memory of all the folks who are still losing with COVID-19 and EXO, the thoughts that are, my vice chair also mentioned several other folks in his district, but the one that jumped out at me today, uh, and I don't know if, if any of you, uh, especially the Sacramento family, uh, ever had the opportunity to meet or come in contact with Scott Lay, who died earlier this month at the Sacramento home, in the Sacramento home, at the age of 48, worked as an advocate and CEO of the Community College League of California, where he advocated tirelessly for community colleges and fought to make higher education affordable and accessible for all. But many of the California capital community will most remember Scott for his skill in developing and sharing digital news and his passion for California politics and policy. Scott was a pioneer in sharing digital news, first through an email digest he co-founded more than 15 years ago called the Roundup, and later through the Nooner, his publication that reached thousands of people every day with his insights about California politics and policy. Utilizing and expanding on those technical skills, Scott went on to build a free legislative bill tracking system and campaign contribution database that surpassed similar databases offered either at cost or operated by public agencies. Scott also had a lifelong passion for raising awareness and money to fight uh, cystic fibrosis, which he shared among the capital community he had suffered with severe asthma as a young boy growing up in Orange County and had befriended many children diagnosed with this cystic fibrosis during his long stint at the local children's hospital. Scott Lay will be remembered for his pioneering role he played in bringing information and awareness to the capital community and for his generosity and willingness to help others. And with that, oh, I see a hand from Member Gaines. Member Gaines, you may have known him. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not uh, know Scott, but um, he had quite a, uh, a good reputation and um, people followed his newsletter closely. And uh, so, yeah, absolutely want to recognize him and uh, all the contributions that he made in his life. and. Uh, I, I'd be remiss not to also mention the sacrifice made by the Gee family with Nicole's passing. And thank you for Member Schaefer for highlighting that and, and the other Marines whose lives were lost. Uh, but I'd like to also add that I attended a memorial service not too long ago for Officer Grimmel, uh, who was on his way to the Caldor fire and through a freak accident on the freeway, a truck passed through the median and killed him. And he was uh, a young officer from the city of Galt. Uh, he was the first Sikh member uh, of that police department. 
and um, did a wonderful job uh, as an officer. His family is very proud of the uh, his accomplishment. And as you may recall, there were acts of violent discrimination against Sikhs uh, through some of our uh, Middle East wars, and so um, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, uh, just want to um, just offer my condolences and uh, thank the family for his service. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, and sorry to hear the sad news about an officer like that. Uh, with that, if there's no other adjourning motions, uh, this meeting is adjourned uh, at, uh, I have like 2.12. Our next meeting is scheduled for October 19th, 20th, and 21st. So if you could please hold those three dates. With that, I will be signing off and thank you staff, uh, our executive director and and actually all our staff within our respective districts as well. This was a job well done. Thank you. Thank you members. Thank you staff.